Good evening, good morning, wherever you may be on this great planet of ours called Earth. I'm Jamie, your host from the Rocket Diaries, and we have a fantastic episode brought to you by the one and only Damien Mannard and myself, Jamie McNichol. Before we introduce our special guests, I want to introduce Damien the Reckoning Mannard from South Carolina. How are you going, man? I'm doing really well. How are you tonight, Jamie? Good, man. And I'm so grateful that you got up so early your time. You're drinking your first cup of coffee. You're a trooper. Man, you didn't have to get up this early, but because you're part of the show, I appreciate it, man. Yeah, I kind of have to. You know, uh, it's it's part of, part of being part of the show. <laughs> I just have to... Go with the flow and and take it the way it is, no matter what. Yeah, man, and what an awesome episode we had last week. We spoke to Marwan from Akwakasada, who is a thrash metal band from Iraq, and just hearing the stories of his survival and freedom is just um, phenomenal. And for those people who haven't listened to that yet, please go to the Rocket Diaries channel on YouTube. We are setting up our own website, which is still juggling around a few things and whatnot, but we are getting some other people to join, especially tonight. We have got one of the most influential bands from Australia, Damien, in the last, give or take, just over the last decade, maybe more, right? They have played with Many bands opening, and just to name a few, we talk about Egg Guy, we talk about Halloween, but more importantly, they've been to America, they've been overseas, they've been doing some touring. As a matter of fact, Damien, they've just released a new album last year. It's an album that took five years to make because they were doing other projects like re-recording old material, EP, a live CD, DVD, and also a box set. We've got the one and only Andy, the bass master, Dowling from Lord. Good evening, Dowling. <laughs> oh, hey, guys. How you going? Good, man. And long time no here, man. The last time I spoke to you would have been around about 2014, 15 at the New Dead Festival here in Adelaide when you were on the bill. And you had been busy, you've been married in that time, you've been overseas, you've been doing all these production work behind the scenes with, of, of course, with with um, with um Tim and Mark, and, and you've also been looking for a new drummer. You've been, bus- <laughs> you've been busy, man, you've been busy. Well, I must say, uh, just to kick it off, thanks so much for that gracious intro. I, I, it was like it was almost like this big uh, announcement before I was about to walk out on stage. So I appreciate that, Jamie. That was really nice. Um, that, but yeah, it's been it's been years since since we've met, and um, any any time I'm in Adelaide, in particular, um, it's all it's always a bit of a wild time. Uh, you know, they're, they're some of the best crowds in the country for us. We've always had this really close connection with Adelaide, in particular. And um, and it's always a it's a big drinking town as well. So uh, as soon as we get off stage, uh, or maybe halfway through our set, we're usually got cracking a few beers and, and enjoying them as we wrap yeah. up the set, and, and then continue on with uh, with people like yourself and just really enjoying, uh, you know, this uh, hospitable uh, group of people that are just so passionate for for music and in particular heavy music as well. So it's nice to it's nice to reconnect and, and of course as well to meet Damien for the first time as well. So I'm looking forward to having a chat. Yeah, well, just before Damien gets into the show, because he's still drinking his cup of coffee in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you, Damien. Uh, but, um, Andy, um, uh, with everything that's been going on in the world, I mean, obviously, before we talk about the music side of things, Damien came to me 
before Christmas. I said, Jamie, you've been doing your blood, sweat, and metal for about eight years. How about we spike things up and let's bring the artist onto the show, but have a bit more of a, like a Joe Rogan type of show, but it's called The Rocker Diary, where we actually talk not only about your music career, but your upbringing and just basically life in general. And more importantly, Damien, Andy does have a podcast himself, which we'll get into later on. Because, oh, that's cool. Because as you and I know, Damien, there's been a lot of changes, especially when it comes to for, um, for YouTube in particular and the centering and how much your audience gets to see your product on Facebook and social media. We will get into that as we go along. But Andy... Yesterday, a very tragic thing, and also another thing that just happened earlier today too. We'll go on that one first. The drummer from Corrosion Com- um, Commodity, the drummer, they were expected to come here in about a week time. The drummer has passed away. Mm, great. Un- yeah. Unknown death at the moment. There's been reports of, of his death, but there's no reports of his death whatsoever right now. But that's shocking. They were supposed to tour Australia in about a week time. That could be postponed now. And also, one of your idols, um, Andy, Kobe Bryant, passed away with his daughter. Nine people died in the helicopter crash. I want to talk about your upbringing because you also was a basketball fan and Kobe Bryant was one of your icons when you were a kid. So just Touch on that if you can, then. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think I think also just the the deaths today of Reed from Corrosion to Conformity. Uh, I'm, I I saw them just to, just to really touch on this quickly. Um, yeah. I saw Corrosion to Conformity for the first time supporting Pantera on the last Australian tour in 2001, and yeah. um, I think they were touring America's Volume Dealer, which was uh, the album, and there was a little bit left field for them. Uh, it was a little bit more sort of southern rock rather than the gritty sort of punk metal sort of crossover stuff that they've been sort of uh, well accustomed to for quite a few years. But I remember like just getting so excited about corrosion more so than Pantera at the time, but all the other guys who were waiting to get in uh, in the afternoon before doors opened, no one really knew who corrosion was. And I kept telling them, I'm going, you got to check him out. And they're just like, whatever. And, um, and it was one of the, one of the coolest gigs I've ever been to, but I, I've got a funny feeling. And, and, and what you said before, I mean, no one knows what's happened exactly. Yeah. Um, and we don't know what's happening with the tour because the tour kicks off in, in about a week and a half's time. So it's really, really close. But I've got a feeling that they already have a different drummer touring with them anyway. So it'll be interesting to see whether they they cancel or postpone just, just due to, you know, you know, whether it be family and friends and paying respects and you know, Yeah, maybe out of respect. Like that. Yeah, yeah. So it might be it might be that, um, even if they do have a different drummer. So we'll we'll have to wait and see. So it's yeah. it's a tragic thing because we've had so many you know, just, just this year, like straight away, we're only a few weeks into 2020 and we've already had some amazing musicians pass away, let alone everybody else. So it's, yeah. um, we, we've only just got started. So hopefully things slow down a little bit uh, when it comes to, to people people passing on. Um, yeah. but, but Kobe, um, yeah, I, uh, I woke up in the morning, my wife woke me up and said, she said, oh, Kobe died. And I went, what? And, you know, I'm half, I'm half asleep. I've got no idea what's going on. And then, you know, sure enough, I grab the phone. And I start scrolling through trying to work out what's happened. And, and um, oh, there's just no words to describe. Yeah, you know, it's really hard. It's, so, it's such a shocking thing. And I think even if you weren't a basketball fan, just knowing it's just one of those iconic figures that is a household name around the world. And I think it's just one of these people that until something happens, you always assume that they're immortal. You know, they, they, they'll just always be around. They're a household name. Um, but for me, I, I've, you know, I grew up as, as one of those kids in the 90s that loved the NBA, loved basketball cards. Um, here in Australia, we had the NBL, the Australian version of the Basketball League. I used to go to a lot of games there as well and um, just got a lot of fun, fond memories of that. And I was, such a, I was such a nerdy little kid because I was this fat little, little kid that could not play ball whatsoever, but I tried so hard. Um, I always wore these oversized basketball jerseys and the cap and everything, and I had all my favourite players. And I remember uh, it was the year for Kobe to be drafted and um, I had these really nerdy scrapbooks. And so I was like, you know, gluing 
pieces of uh, magazine clippings and newspaper clippings and everything into this scrapbook. And um, and I found um, one of the scrapbooks uh, yesterday because I went digging when I, when I found out the news. But I also found um, back in the late 90s, Dad took me to a Lakers game in LA and they played the Dallas Mavericks. And um, that was the first time I ever got to see a basketball game. It was like, you know, what would be, I'm, I'm not a religious guy, but what I would assume would be as close to a religious experience as I could possibly get at that age. And yeah. um, Cody came off the bench and it was a really weird thing. It was his second season. So he was still, he was popular, but he wasn't at the, at that level where he was ready to start. So a lot yeah. of the veterans were still playing at that time. And so he had to come off the bench, but he scored 30 points that night. He, he still got his minutes and, and put on a, put on a great, great show for everybody. And so yesterday was just this real, just real sort of quiet day for me because I was, I was watching everybody reflect on social media and all these pictures and videos and, and amazing stories. And I was just sitting there with this scrapbook and I found this, the ticket stubs from, from the game that, that I went to and, and the game sheet with all the, the, the lineup for, for who played on the night. And it was just this real surreal moment. It's like, wow, this is, this has really happened. And I think it's just one of these things where I'm sure you guys agree as life moves on and we all get older and we start to see these icons, these idols that we, we look up to and, and respect and enjoy, whether it be music or sports or anything. And as they get older or things happen, tragedies happen, we start to really, it's just this constant reminder that we're, we're, we're not here for a long time. And you sort of have to look around and go, okay, well, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? So, you know, really make the most of, of today and, and, and the moment that I'm in right now. So it was, it, it shouldn't take that to, to make you think that way, but it certainly yeah. did that for me yesterday and made me uh, do a lot of reflection, reflecting. So, um, yeah. yeah, a very, very interesting day. I remember waking up around about 6 o'clock Adelaide time and the news was just popping up. It wasn't actually confirmed that Kobe was dead. His name was mentioned. And I took no notice. I said, okay, yeah, it's just a rumour going around, as you know how the media likes to spin things. So I went back to sleep and I woke back up around 8.30 and then it was just flooded was Kobe Bryant that has been confirmed. Not only that, it was also confirmed that his daughter was on the helicopter with him. Mm. At, at, and that's what hit the most. Now, <clears throat> you mentioned back in the 90s. Yes, it's true. Like, back at high school for myself, over in Western Australia, NBA and the NBL, particular the Perth Wildcat, was so popular in the mid-90s to the late 90s. Because in the NBA, you had Jordan, Pippen, Rodman, Luke Longley, Charles Barkley, and then Chuck O'Neill. And then, in the next generation, as you mentioned in the draft, you had Kobe Bryant just started to come through. People wanted to be someone. Larry what, Bird, all those Jordan, guys. Yeah, Larry Bird was with Jordan, so was Magic Johnson and... Kasima, him, and all them. But what really was fascinating was going down to the basketball court at lunchtime at high school just to see the kids play. They wanted to be the next Jordan or the next Shaq who can break a backboard or one <laughs> of those things, right? But the, most importantly, when it comes to sport and music, someone wants to be someone. And with Kobe, he had a lot of um, potential and he did show that on the court and a lot of people looked up to him as one of the icons which is funny enough sometimes, just sometimes meeting your idol can be your worst day <laughs> it can be <laughs> it can be your worst day but I mean even after his death was announced there was a story that came out about his rape allegation. I'm saying, man, it's not the time to talk about this. I mean, he's been accused of rape. I don't think it's been, he was actually found, he actually did rape, but he was accused of rape. People are still bringing it up many years later. I'm saying, man, it's not the time to talk about it. It just passed away. But I get it. People will, people will start stirring the pot one way or another. Going back to basketball for a second, I think, the main reason why people looked at it was the film White Man Can't Jump. 
Mm-hmm. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> and not only that, you had that Michael Jordan one with Bugs Bunny, Face Jam. That <laughs> that started up as well. But that what that's what started the the momentum here in Australia. And funny enough, Damien, where Lord is based in, they've got a team called the Wollongong. Well, it's not Wollongong, Illawarra Hawks. They get a film clip back in. Oh, let's go. Correct me if I'm wrong. 2011, 12. Yeah, around then. Yeah. And um, it was at it was at the place where the Illawarra Hawks played. So, yeah. Oh, yeah wow. I mean, that, that was a really cool thing for me because uh, you know I grew up in in uh, Brisbane, which is uh, yeah, sort of North Queensland and uh, one of the capital cities in Australia. And um, we had a team there called the Brisbane Bullets. And so my sort of upbringing was all about the Brisbane Bullets, and we had some great players and. Won a, won a few championships over the years, and so I was really sort of going to a lot of games and seeing all these uh, all these uh, uh, teams from different states around the country come in and, and, and play against the Bullets. And the Hawks were one of these teams that was just a real a real ferocious team, my dog, just a, a real tough team to play, and as well as the Wildcats over in Perth as well. I mean, they were just that's, yeah. that's a legacy team over there. They're, they're legendary, um, and and so when. I mean, there's a lot of lot of things that have happened over the years, but um, about 15 odd years ago, I moved from Brisbane to Sydney, and um, our band is based in Wollongong, which is where uh, the Illawarra Hawks were based, and um, and so their stadium, their home, their home turf is called the Snake Pit. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it's the Snake Pit, and um, it's Win it's Win Stadium, so uh, Win Arena or whatever it is, and um, yeah, so we we contacted the. Uh, the the arena and just said um have you got any days where nobody's in there and so they they gave us a few days and we asked how much and they said no you can you can go in there for free and we thought oh this is amazing and um they just said as long as you don't need anything from us and we said well we just need some power and that's it we'll we'll sort ourselves out we'll we'll look after ourselves just someone give us a key to get in and and we'll get some power going and we'll we'll be happy and the only thing they asked um from the arrangement was that they had a copy of what we ended up producing so they could add it to their I guess they've got some sort of archive of everything that's happened in that arena over the years so we made sure that we sent them a copy of the of the album and, and a copy of the, the video clip and, and just a little bit of a historic record for them but yeah for me like it's always it's a weird I mean I don't often sort of get the chance to sort of talk about a lot of what's happened in the past um, but I've always found my life sort of uh, intertwining between heavy metal and basketball and and when you look at it separately they look like just polar opposites and they just do not complement each other whatsoever but over the years i've met so many music fans that i mean i think most music fans are sports fans of some sort anyway they've always got a team that they like no matter what the what the type of sport is but the amount of basketball fans that i've met over the years and i've just built this great connection with people because of this uh, shared love on top of heavy metal has been has been super cool. So even now, like I feel like I'm I'm more into basketball than I ever was before. Just really enjoying uh, the leagues in in the states, the NBA, and and here in Australia, the NBL. Yeah. Now, going on before we get Damien on, the question that always triggers my mind, especially when it comes to sport in general, do you think these athletes deserve to be paid that much? Because I know when I was in high school, I had a guy who ended up playing for the Wildcats. He got picked up as a rookie. They won a premiership, NBL premiership. But when you look at it in in hindsight, do you think these people, I mean, some of these contracts in the NBA are just outrageous. I wish I had that money. (laughs) But, (laughs) But the question is, should they be paid that amount of money because you can't spend that amount of money surely uh, i know I'm, I know I'm sure it, they're trying <laughs> yeah but i, I get it I'm, <laughs> i get it it goes it, i get it it goes towards their their children education or if they're still in college some of these people who get drafted are still in college they're paying the, the college fees and whatnot but when they get like ridiculous amount of money like all right, let's let's estimate two hundred and fifty million a year. Yeah, plus you got sponsorship deals. Yeah, plus you get out of bonuses. Yeah, I get that. Should they require that amount of money? 
Well, it's it, it's a very common theme thing that you you hear from people because I guess for for most of us, you know, we're we're well, I'll make an assumption about you guys, but I'm certainly an average Joe. You know, I'm I'm not earning a lot of money and and sort of just living a pretty pretty average sort of lifestyle. Although I, I get to have a lot of fun and do lots of interesting things, but. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think I think the world's an interesting place, and it all comes down to something. It, it comes down to the market, and I think ultimately it's what gets attention. And with with I think American sports. I mean, Damien will be able to chime in on, on a lot of this, but it's sort of you know you've got a big population in the United States, and a lot of the American sports are popular globally, um, and the NBA especially is very very popular globally probably one of the biggest sports in the world, um, you know, probably just behind soccer or on par with soccer, depending on which country you live in. And in the end, there, there's, a, there's a lot of money to be made. And, and this is a, these are massive organisations that, uh, that bring in a lot of money from advertisements and uh, TV deals and, and all, merchandising and all this sort of stuff. And, and ultimately, it's, it's all because of the personalities that are, that are on the court who slog it out and play these games. And yeah. it... It is. It's. It's hard to digest as somebody who just earns an average amount of money per year. But um, I think. I guess there's part part of it you sort of look at and go, well, I think they're deserving to get a piece of the pie because ultimately people are making money off them. And I think when you look at it, look at it in comparison to how much money the the individual teams and the leagues are generating every year, mm. um, it's probably it's probably a respectable percentage that they're earning. Now. Whether it's too much money for one person, it's probably a really good argument because you know, I mean, there's only so much money you can spend on a day-to-day basis, and I mean, how? Yeah. I mean, yeah, like there's always the stereotypes of having the big house, the flash cars, the, the private jet, and all that sort of stuff. But I guess it all comes down to, you know, whether you're happy and you're satisfied. And I'm sure, I'm, well, I mean, there's there's been so many stories of, uh, you know, sort of late '90s NBA players who had this. There was always that bad boy era. Of guys who just wasted their money on 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 excess of everything and mm. end up flat broke, which is just incredible that it could happen. But it just it's it's uh, it it comes down to the individual and what they do with the money. And I think the the good stories are the guys you know who continuously spend uh, a lot of their money donating it back into charities and organisations or their community where they grew up. A lot of these guys right. have been in real sort of difficult. Uh, parts of major cities um that you know they, they were struggling and they may have may have got a break and had a bit of an opportunity a, a scholarship or a, you know something a once in a lifetime opportunity and so there's there's a lot of good examples of those guys giving back as well so i i get it man because it's so it is so much money like you can't even fathom how like i, I, don't, I don't even know like it's not the case of like winning the lottery or anything like that because yeah. it, it, it's it surpasses that it's it's just in, it's insane but um I think I'd go crazy if I over, if I thought about it too much. I think um, I think yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and I think I think yeah, it's, like, it's like perpetually winning the lottery, right? Yeah, yeah, and you and you and you dream about yeah. Well, if I won the lottery, then I'd do this, and I would do that, and and you sort of and it's a bit of a fun little exercise you can do every once in a while. But if you obsess over it, then you just go insane. <laughs> and, yeah, well. And, and and I think just quickly as well, just to compare it with music because it's a it's a common thing with musicians so a lot of musicians uh, get a bit bitter because they're not earning a lot of money from their craft and when you look at it you know musicians put in a lot of time and and a lot of blood sweat and tears into into their yeah something that's very personal to themselves it's their creative output and they're putting it out there but i guess this is where uh you know musicians have to find uh and uh, a degree of satisfaction in what they do and and a degree of fulfillment no matter what and right. if if the market turns around and finds what you do great and you can get the attention, then you can obviously you know get some revenue out of that. You can you can dig into that income stream and and, and benefit off it. But you know if if the market's not not working in your favour, then you know it's I know a lot of great musicians who are just so happy and so fulfilled to be able to just make do and just create some great music and have, and especially with the internet now, I mean, you can share it with everybody straight away. You don't have to get through the gatekeepers or the, the record label executives and all that, all those sort of old stereotypes uh, from, from years gone by. Now it's just a case of it's, it's easier to record. You can get better quality and you can put your, your heart and your heart and soul out there into the internet and connect with people straight away. So 
um, it's a it's a different world now, and um, it is. And, and I think it's just how how we look at it. How, and is it a glass half full perspective, or is it a glass half empty? Yeah. Well, say, so Damien, you you've had um, a bit of success in your life too. I mean, you've done a lot of things for charity as well. You walked across America not once but twice for wow. the fallen for the fallen. <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat. For the fallen comrades and the wounded that have served overseas in like Iraq or Afghanistan and so forth. But man, I just want to touch a little bit on that for Andy because he's also it's inspired with people that do that type of stuff to not only to be recognized, because Damien, you didn't do this to be recognized. You did this for a cause and a purpose. And you're not get like I said, you I didn't did. you didn't did. do it. Yeah. I yeah, you didn't do it once, man. You'd done it twice. Every mile was for one wounded soldier. Yeah, for one uh, one killed in in action. Yeah. yeah each yeah. each mile that I walked was for a uh, for a human being that had been killed on the battlefield. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, I mean, that's that's such a. I mean, knowing the size of the United States, um, I think. Just doing it anyway is, is a big feat, but to, to have that purpose, uh, you yeah, know, it's that's. I mean, I, I would assume Damien, you and I'm sure you can, you can tell us, but you know, you you must surely have had family or friends or people, you know, that you've met uh, along the way that you've uh, you've had a connection with that's um, that's been affected by by war. Oh, absolutely! On a on a daily basis, when I was uh, walking across, I would. Um, have experiences with people or uh, or meet somebody who had been at war at one time or another or um, I even met with some of the families who I was um, walking for so it was um, it was a really great experience it was a a learning um, experience for me I I really um I took the journey in as a whole and um, and was able to maybe have some experiences that normal everyday people don't get to normally have. Um, but I'm I'm just a normal person, just like just like you guys, you know, I'm I'm just a normal everyday average person uh, who decided to to do something that I thought was um, valuable in my heart. So it, it wasn't really about recognition or, uh, or claiming any fame or anything like that, because that's really just not my, my fame to claim anyway. No, um, cause the last five but, years that I've known you, Damien, you always been that laid back type of bloke. And we can talk about anything to music, to what's going on in the world, to, basically anything man and this is this is what is so powerful and Andy was just mentioned this is this is how the world is now it the digital technology so to speak it's a digital world it makes it so easy for us to correspond with one another not like it was back 30 years ago where we used to do snail mail <laughs> and, oh yeah and sometimes sometimes the letters do not get to the destination <laughs> now <laughs> <laughs> True. I mean, how many times, how many times you hear stories of bottles of letters rock up on the coastline that's been sent out like sixty years ago, like in the World War Two or something, and they're rocking up on the on the coastline. Now, now you can talk to anyone on on Skype or stream or whatever device you want to call it. But um, you're right there too, Andy. Um, when it comes to music. We also had people that are on both sides of the spectrum. You have those ones that just do it for the love of music. And the other one are kind of still bitching, if I can use that word bluntly, and moaning <laughs> and moaning of not getting the exposure they require. Because when you look at music as a whole, you know, record labels come and go. There's digital media, the digital platform. But 
the problem that I have with it, and this is this is this is one of the things I really do hate here in Australia. We don't have enough radio where it's independently or commercial to play the material to the masses. The only way that people are going to hear the music is they go to a live show in general. But you do have a leg up. There is a there is a platform once again called YouTube. And that's what people are getting attracted to to discover bands now. Not like the old days where it was word it was solely word of mouth. You know, if you, if you wanted to hear something or if you want to get interested in something, it was word of mouth or going down to your local news day every Thursday and pick up your local gig guide and find out where the best gigs are, where it's <laughs> local or whatnot. Now, when it comes to social media, especially when you're promoting your own band for a gig, there is another thing too that really gets up my nerve is when Facebook, doesn't present itself the way it should be. You have to pay in a, a subscription or like an advert. You've got to pay five bucks minimum to get the post to reach out to a wider audience. The more money you generate, the more money you put into it, the bigger the volume of the audience can see the post. Do you yeah, have? Yeah, but those aren't organic. Those aren't organic views. You're not. You know, that's you pay true. for those people to come to come get you know to come see your ad or whatever they you had to pay for that so it's exactly. not organic it's not organic and that's the thing when bands are starting up i'm not saying lord because lord's been around for over a decade but when new right. bands when new bands are starting up they need to promote their the band and the gig and so forth so forth right it's a mark it's a business too not only are you a magician, but you've got to treat it like a business. And the way that you do that, you do it on social media, where Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. But I know for an instance on Facebook, the volume of how much it goes to an audience is restricted. Therefore, you've got to put money into it. And I believe it's $5 minimum. The more you put wow. in, the more it goes through. But like you said, Damien, it's not organic. I... I mean, well, and I think, I think another thing lies in this, that um, the capability for people to hold their attention on something is about 30 seconds now. So if you don't catch people's attention within that first 30 seconds, they're just going to turn it anyway. Well, that's true. That's true. But what I'm saying is too, Damien, is that Say you're friendless, right? Say that you've got a couple of thousand friends on your on your Facebook, right? You post up a status or a photo or whatever. Say that you've been to, you go to Five Finger Death Punch, Damien, and you post That's up a photo. Awesome. You, yep, you post up a photo. Those couple of thousand people ain't going to see it. It's only a small volume of that friend on your friend list is seeing it. That, that's my point. If you're if you're in a band like Lord, for example, who's got tens of thousands of followers, right, and also they've got that personal handle where Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, that generates another volume as well. But when it comes to Facebook, that smaller portion is only seeing it. The only way that they're going to see it, you pay for it, which I reckon it's a lot of bollocks if you ask me. Right. Andy? Right, it's I'm a, not going to pay Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough one. Um, I, I think, I, I don't know, I'm a bit of a unique one when it comes to social media and I guess how to promote bands these days because I've always enjoyed the tinkering or the experimentation of trial and error and seeing what works and what doesn't. And every time, you know, Facebook's that, that example, but every time the goalposts are changed, I, I sort of... I get a bit excited. It's frustrating at some point because you sort of like, well, I built this up and now I've got to try and do something with what the changes are. But I also try to get a bit of excitement out of it as well because it's sort of like, okay, well, I know that when this happens, a lot of people are going to be left in the dust. You know, people will give up and throw the towel in, which isn't, isn't a great thing, but it motivates me to go, all right, okay, what can I do to, to make the most of this change? And so I, th I think for 
bands. It's brought out a lot of new skills and a lot more expertise that people have been able to uh, self-promote and, and get themselves out there and talk about their craft a lot more because, to be honest, they, they have to now. You've, you've got to communicate with people. And I've certainly become more social and more engaging with people because I, I know that there's a benefit of doing so. And it, it feels good. It's great. Um, oh, but, yeah. Yeah, with the way the way that the internet is these days, it's it's fantastic in the sense that you can connect with pretty much anybody in the world really really quickly. But um, there's so many different platforms out there as well. So you know, you, yes, Facebook of course is, is one of the biggest ones there, and then then you've got Instagram and Twitter and and YouTube. YouTube's massive um, now. Like a lot more of the streaming services are, are coming into everyday life now. So Spotify is one of those big ones, and Apple Music, etc. And the way that I sort of look at it is I just drop seeds everywhere. I, I, I make sure there's accounts for the band in as many places as I can. Some accounts may be more active than others, but I'm always making sure that um, I've uploaded where I can uh, links to, you know, our merchandise, our music, video clips, um, s- streaming links, whatever it might be. So in the event that you might have uh, somebody that is purely a YouTube fan and they don't use Facebook or they don't use uh, any of the other uh, social media uh, sort of platforms that they can still find us on YouTube. And yeah. if they just use Twitter and not, nothing else, then I just make sure that we're on Twitter. And at least if they're searching for something, then we might pop up in their search feeds. And and even going back, and it sounds funny to say old school because <laughs> we're talking about the internet here, but, uh, you know, the old school email list. I mean, email lists are so important. And so we've, we've collated all these email addresses from when people have ordered from us over the years and, and sent yeah. us emails and, and we've collected all them. And so we've got a mailing list. So in the event that Facebook absolutely implodes and no one can reach anybody anymore and you have to pay a million dollars to try and you know promote promote an event or something like that, we've still got our core audience on email that we can flick them an email or yeah. post somewhere on another channel. So uh, I think for me it's a bit different because uh, for our band, we've always been very DIY always right from the get-go and we've been really proud of it something that we've actually been it's been part of our branding like we've always said we everything is in-house everything we do is in-house we 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 promote ourselves we we record ourselves we we we, we've created our own record label that releases the music and does everything we do our own video clips everything is in-house amongst the you know the, the three or four of us depending on who's in the band at the time and for me uh you know merchandising and promotion um, and getting word out there about the band is, has been a sort of my right. domain for at least the, probably the, yeah probably the last decade. Um, so I find it really fun and interesting. But I know a lot of peers and a lot of friends that have struggled and get yeah. really frustrated because they just can't they can't share things with people the way that they used to, and it's it, it is difficult. And and I miss man. I like you, Jamie. You said it before, but the you know waiting each week for the gig guide to come out or you know, or yep. the street press or whatever it might be, you know, the, the tangible pa- paper or the magazine or whatever it is, yep. like that stuff was gold. That was the best way to connect with people, especially in your local area. You just put an advert in or, you know, sometimes you get a free classified, like a little gig mention or something yep. like that. And yep. that was that was amazing. And, and well, it's just different now. So we have to find the next thing. And I'm sure in like 10, 15 years time, there'll be, there'll be the next wave of people bitching about how things aren't, the way that they are now you know it'll, just, yep. it'll always be a, a sort of a, a, a sort of a cycle that will just continue on but um I, I find it i find it fascinating the way that everything moves so quickly and we've just got to keep we've just got to keep running yeah you mentioned before that people find it hard now and get frustrated it happened with Brudge wet and metal and also last week on the rocket diary we had such an awesome guest on the show last week and damon you agree with that I mean, you said, man, that was a, that was a gold episode. Yes, we beat our own drum that on that. Just, but but, but the, the, the thing is, when you the thing I find out, the thing I find the most depressing thing when it comes to podcasting on music, especially the heavy metal scene, if it's a not if it's not a big name band, they're not going to listen to it. You, you'll get views for the smaller bands, but if they don't know who the band is, they're not going to pay attention. And, Damon, you mentioned this before. The, 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 um, 
the attention span now is like 30 seconds. If you don't grab them within that 30 seconds, you lose your audience. You know what I mean? I was watching the replay on the premiere of that episode last week. Man, we got up to 25 views, and then you just saw the numbers started to drop. You know what I mean? If, you, if we didn't catch... I don't know. It's, it's touch and go. Everyone has their own vibe and their own way to produce their show and how they run their show and that. But it's just frustrating when it comes to podcasting, and we were going into this, Danny, because you've got a podcast as well, mm. that how do you keep hold of that audience rather than they switching off in the first 30 seconds to a couple of minutes? Oh, man, it is such a tough, tough thing, and I've, I've had the same challenges over the years. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story because – I've been I've been doing podcasting for the past oh, five years, I think. Yeah, um, about, so, five, about five yeah, years. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I've I've done a few different types of podcast, a few different shows, uh, but the main one that I've been doing since day dot is the Andy Social Podcast, and it's it's like what you guys are doing, just chat to really interesting people and and learn about the world around you and just you know, have have some really stupid conversations and, and, and have some laughs, but have some really serious ones as well. And it's just really, really fun. Like for me personally, it's just been fantastic. It's been the best self-development tool I could ever possibly have. Um, but when I started, I mean, we were, we were doing really well as a band. Um, and I sort of, we had a bit of a lull where we weren't doing as much at the time. We were in between albums. Um, we I think we wrapped up a, a tour and uh, we didn't have it a lot on our plate in sort of the near, the foreseeable future. And I, I started having these thoughts about, oh, man, what would happen if I, like, if the band just stopped playing? Like, if, if the band just didn't exist anymore, what would happen to me? And I was thinking about my identity and I'll go, oh, everyone knows me as a musician or the, or the bass player in, in this band, Lord. And so uh, at the same time, I was just starting to get into podcasts. I was listening to all these podcasts. And I thought, oh, this is fun. And I thought I might just do it as a, as a bit of a side hustle, a bit of a – just another interest that I could get involved with and enjoy, especially while the band was a little bit quiet at that time. But the thing that I really sort of made a mistake with is that I assumed that because people knew me from the band, that they would automatically just start listening to my podcast. And man, it was like tumbleweeds. It was horrible to begin with. Like no, nobody cared whatsoever about my podcast. And it was, it was a real testing time for me because I realized that I couldn't just expect people just to just to turn around and pay attention to what I do. Like I had to earn it just like we did in the band, you know, just because we're a band doesn't mean that people are going to listen to our music. Our music's got to be good. We've got to get out there and play shows. We've got to do all the, we've got to put the effort in in order for people to actually respond. So right. I just, I just, just slogged it out, man. Like guys, I just, I just, every, every week I was putting out episodes and, and I would see the same thing, like the start of the episode, it would it would it would peak and and you know be the most amount of people listening at the beginning of the of the episode, and then it would just trail off, and and I'd be like, oh man, what am I doing wrong? And I just thought, in the end, I could tweak things and improve things if I felt that I needed to do it, but if I was really enjoying it, I think the long game is the best way to do it. And I think the great thing about podcasting is that, yes, the big names do attract a lot of attention but it's short-term attention. Those people that are only attracted to big names right. don't stick around. Right, so because... because yeah, sorry sorry for butting in. You, yeah. You're spot on. You're, sorry for butting in. You're, you get get spot on. Because I remember the very first episode of Blood, Sweat and Metal, I spoke to the band from Melbourne called Copia. Okay. That that produced eh, around about five to 600 views right cool the second episode i did heaven the axe that got nice. that got 1100 views so it went from five to 1100 it wasn't until i got rob jukes the day that he got fired from exodus on his honeymoon that, <laughs> that, the, that the numbers skyrocket and that's when you know record labels started to get sent me an email, said, Jamie, you want to be on our mailing list? We'll send you this, um, our artist on your platform. I said, yeah, sure. The numbers went up, but like I said, when when these new bands that, that were coming up on the record label, people didn't really know the numbers 
started to dwell off, right? Like I spoke to Dave Ellison from Megadeth and I had like seven and a half thousand views and the next week mm, I'd, cool. I'd, get a, I'd get a one of these new bands that goes right back down to 38. And you go, I get it. They just want this. They just want that. But what really hit the wall with me is when I started to pay attention to the freaking politics. I'm not, I'm not, hey, I'm not political. I, I just hate the corruption that's going on with the, with the politics, especially now that it comes to the bushfire stuff, right? People are literally turning their backs on me if I mention anything about the politics side of things. <laughs> they don't want the truth to be heard, man. That's the thing. They just don't want the truth to be heard. And it's just, frust- it's just frustrating that you're going down this long highway and it's a journey. And you've got everyone working together as a team. But when it comes to the audience, you've got no control of that. They're either going to watch it or they're not going to watch it. Yeah, very true. And I think, I, I mean, James, it's a great point because the thing that I found over the years of doing it is that you would you would be up and down all the time, depending on who you had on. You had really popular guests and the, the numbers would, would, would peak and then you'd have a guest that no one's heard of and they, they'd be low. And I found that, what has brought people back over time is that they start to get familiar with you. So yeah. they, it's not so much the guest anymore. The guest is, is still part of the attraction, but it's, it's about the people that are speaking to the guest. You know, you mentioned, you mentioned earlier in the, in the beginning about sort of taking this path where it's a little bit more sort of Joe Rogan-esque, you know, and yeah. the reason why Joe Rogan's so popular is that, I mean, sometimes I'll look and I'll go, Oh wow, that guest, that'd be so exciting to listen to. But it's like, I, I'm excited for Joe Rogan to talk to that person, not so much just about that person, because that person could get interviewed by anybody and I wouldn't pay attention. But because it's on Rogan's podcast, I'll listen to it because I know, like, I like the way that Rogan talks to people. I like his personality and that's what makes his podcast so unique. So for you guys and for me, like, what I find is that people will return and it might be a smaller number overall, but it gradually grows and it's a long, it takes a long time. But they become more familiar with you and your personality, the things that you like, the things that you don't like. And, hey, definitely take the plunge and get political if, it's, if you're passionate about it. And you, you might lose a few people on the way. You might lose a lot of people. Oh, but yeah. it doesn't matter because people get to know you and they get to know what you're all about. And I think if you're honest and upfront and the biggest thing is being genuine. If people know that you're genuine and you're not you know, sort of fabricating anything or being fake or anything like that, people will really connect with that and that's where you build that loyalty so for me i've just i stopped thinking about a lot of that stuff and and some yep. of the best conversations i've ever had were the people that just didn't register that high on on the uh, old podcast statistics um but what i've also found and i'm sort of thinking as i go here but um the great thing about podcasts is that they stay out there forever you know depending on what you do with them you know if you put them on youtube or you put them you know through one of the podcast uh, hosts you know they're, they're out there and so what you find over time is that people are searching for particular topics or people's names and you might end up getting your episode listened to in two three four five years time um and so even though the immediate reaction that you get from from the general public may not be incredible over time this small gradual growth might end up working in your favor and i've found that i mean i look i try not to look every day because i'll go i'll go be crazy if i'm looking at my podcast stats but every every few days i'll have a quick look to see what's what's going on and i'll find that there'll be this random episode that i recorded like three years ago and something that's had a little spike and i'm like what's going on there and i'll, I'll try and google to see if there's been an article or anything about that person but Sometimes it might be a case that that person has just maybe been speaking about it in conversation with, with a couple of people and has decided to share it on their on their Facebook page or wherever. And, and it's just, it's given me a few more hits and, and that's yeah. that's really cool. So it's it's so frustrating, Jamie, when, when you're sort of, you know, getting that out and venting, I'm like, oh man, I hear you. I hear you, man. It is. <laughs> it's tough. Well, it's not, it's not just that. I mean, I'm thinking about going back to old school. Let's go back to MySpace. Before oh, yes. Facebook, <laughs> man, right. MySpace, man, you didn't have the censorship. Now, I'm I'm strictly on this censorship or shadow banning. It's a proper term, mm. right? They do it on YouTube. They there's a new legislation on YouTube that you've got to change your settings to adult content. If not, you, yep. it's it's for children, and if you do 
If they find you out, you get severely punished for it, right? That's just really good. stupid, honestly. It is. And, it, and I just have, and Damien, you, you agree, I just have a hard time just when we put our material, it's not just this show, we, Andy, Damien and I do parodies on another channel. It's totally different than this. We do a comedy sketch, Damien and I, and it just goes off the charts. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> but going back onto the Rocket Diaries, you know, or well, even before that, Blood, Sweat, Metal, it was just a constant battle. I remember having an argument with my partner. I said, why aren't they freaking listening? It's not me. It's not, it got nothing to do with me. It's I just, really believe, sorry to break in there. Um, no, no, go, go. I, I, I honestly think that it's, it's the fact that, um, when okay when we started this it was to uh to be able to show the lighter side of the band members to exactly. show that they're real people you know they they think the the same kinds of things that we do even though it may uh it may vary in the spectrum they they still they're real people and that's what the what's we wanted to bring to light with this is that you know uh we wanted to delve into their thoughts and their feelings and uh, and their political views and whatever they wanted to talk about. And I, I think that sometimes um, people just don't see their their idols, their bands, their uh, like you were speaking about Kobe earlier. I, you know, they're your idol. You don't think that they're real people. They're like they're like superhuman or something. So, uh, so I, I honestly think that maybe that is why, um, why it's slow going or maybe not as popular as one would think it's because, uh, because they're, they're not seeing their favorite bands as, as real humans. They're, they're seeing them more as, uh, something that is, is uh, um, right. You're right, Damon. Immortal. You're right. Because you're right, Damon. I mean, it. I don't really pay that much attention now that I, now that I've, I took a couple of steps back and actually see it for what it was. It's not. I know it's not me personally. It's not me. It's just that people will choose to watch you or they don't watch you, and we have no control in that. We they yeah. either watch they either watch you or you don't. But. I said it since day one with you, Damien. It's baby step. The the mountain's going to climb eventually, and you've got to go with the motions. It, music's like a fashion trend. <laughs> Every time when fashion changes, music changes. <laughs> and when something happens in the world, something goes on. But the positive of all this is they are going to find, and especially what Andy has found out too, if you stay true to yourself, and not trying to put on a billboard, hey, look at me, I'm such a big shot, you're going to fall every single time. If you just keep doing the, the process correctly and you keep doing it, and the audience will grow. And you, you'll be surprised. I found this out when I was doing Blood, Sweat and Metal. The audience will grow. They will. If you put your dedication into it and you're passionate about it, Numbers will come. Well, I'm definitely dedicated. I'm up at 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> you are, man. You are, man. Oh, I love now, dedication. <laughs> now, Andy, we're going to go into your music, but before we do, when you were growing up, I know you said that you're a little stalky, fat, chubby kid at school, <laughs> yeah. bit of a nerdy, but was your ambition to always be a musician, or do you have any other aspirations that you wanted to be when you were growing up? Uh, well, when I was really young, I think, I think when, when everyone's really young, you sort of, you know, you, you'll, you want to be whatever's shiny and exciting in the moment. And then you sort of quickly get over it and move on. But I mean, I think, I think like a lot of kids, you wanted to do something that was sort of exciting. So I remember like really, really early, like, you know, I wanted to be in the army cause you know, guns and all that sort of stuff. It just sounded exciting as a little boy <laughs> or, or it'd be like a policeman or, you know, firefighter and you know, like just and things that just act action action sort of things very exciting sort of stuff um but i think the first the first things that i sort of wanted to be was um 
was I think well, I really wanted to play basketball, but I sort of I don't know if I wanted that as a career. But music sort of was probably the first sort of sort of pivotal moment in in my life where I sort of went, wow, like I can actually see myself being an older person doing this, like you know, being an adult and and doing this. And and um, I went through all the phases that so many so many young people go through where. You know, first of all, I found whatever was, you know, like the stereotypical tennis racket lying around and pretend I was a guitar <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, and I remember uh, my dad bought me a, a really crappy. Um, actually, he had a couple of acoustic guitars, and I was trying to learn some some songs on there. And he's a, he was a big Beatles fan, and he loved a lot of uh, sort of uh, folk music, sort of a lot of '60s and '70s folk music. So I was sort of learning stuff, but it didn't quite. I didn't identify with it. It was nice, and it was it was kind of fun to learn how to how to play but uh, when he bought me this really crappy electric guitar that was it I, I i i reckon i had it all worked out and uh i listened to whatever was going at the time i mean obviously you know metallica was a big one and and yeah. you know the big four you know slayer and anthrax and megadeth of course and then sort of just went off from there and just discovered all this heavy music and and i listened to a little bit of punk as well at the time there's just some fast yeah. guitars a lot of the sort of early sort of late 80s early 90s punk stuff is sort of like borderline speed metal sort of sort of stuff that was really fun so um, how old were, so how old were you when you were just developing all this oh uh, well i think it would have been just on the borderline of just becoming a teenager so probably only around sort of 12 to 13 because i would have yep, only yep. just been been sort of getting into early stages of high school um yep. and before then and that was really around the, the moment where i was sort of transitioning away from um, being completely ob- obsessed with basketball and then now suddenly becoming completely obsessed with music and then and yeah. especially heavier music as well and yeah. um and then yeah it sort of it just it just gradually went from there and, and it was a, i mean a lot of things that sort of happened over over the coming years between me picking up an electric guitar and then eventually starting to play with other people and you know eventually further down the track you know joining joining the band and and doing all the stuff um over over the past 15 odd years with with the band as well so um but yeah i think i think music was i mean certainly wanted to be a lot of different things i think even now like it, it's a weird thing with my personality i still get really excited about you know the shiny things so i'll have these i'll, I'll read something or i'll watch a documentary or I'll be flicking through social media and i'll see somebody doing something really cool and i'm like i want to do that and I realised, yeah. well, you know, I probably should have started doing that about, you know, 20 years ago instead of uh, me wanting to do it now. But um, yeah, it's it's always been. I just I, I think I get excited about a lot of different things, which which is which makes life really interesting and fun. Now, bit of a history lesson to Damien. Um, that a strain. Just hold on for a second. Um, that's a strain idol here in Australia, Damien, called John Farnham, right? <laughs> and John Farnham was the first artist to ever sell one million records here in Australia. The second person is ACDC, right? But John Farnham was the first art, the first artist in music to sell one million copies here in Australia alone. Now, Dan, Andy, you and I have got a lot of things in common. I was a massive John Farnham fan before I got into the heavy metal scene. Mm. Massive John Farnham fan. We're going back to to his LRB days, Little River Band days, before he made a comeback with Whispering Jack. That's a challenge. I think I've heard of that. You heard you heard the band called Little River Band, Damien? Yeah, man. Yeah, (laughs) definitely. Yeah, Glenn Sharks would. John Farnham replaced Glenn Sharks in the late 70s, early yeah, 80s. Yeah, I, I know who he is. You know who John Farnham is, do you? I do. Yeah. Okay. Burn for you. Yeah, that one. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But anyway, Wonderful um, parts, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, that's a challenge I want to throw to Lord. I know you're done playing to win that LRB, but that's a song... And I reckon it will fit exactly you guys, and also it will fit the world today. It's a song off the Chain Reaction album called All Sons and Daughters. Oh, yeah, great song. I want you guys to really do that because I know you've done other covers and you've done them very, very well. 
And there's another cover I'd like you to do is Born to Rage Hell from Motorhead as well. So that's another oh, cover. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fun song as well, yeah. Yes, but the song All Sons and Daughters, I believe when that song came out in 1989, 1990, that was prolific because the things that was said in that song is basically what we've seen today. Like, you hide your butt, you hide behind your face of secrecy, you line your pockets that's on your side. That's what the government is currently doing. They line their pockets, including with these bush fires. There's so much money being raised to charity, but yet the, it's always happened. When charity makes a fundraiser, that money does not go to the victims. And that song, right. all, that song All Sons and Daughters, it was pretty prolific. That song is so good. I mean, I guess maybe just, I mean, I'm glad, Damien, you know who John Farnham is because I, I could waffle on about John Farnham all day. And, I can I too. Mean, <laughs> I, I love know, I know, <laughs> But um, I think John Farnham's one of those singers, um, and I, I make some pretty bold statements when it comes to John Farnham, and, and I've got a bit of a reputation for being a bit of a fanboy oh, when it comes to him. Hold on but, for a second. Before you yeah. go on, whose idea was it to do the cover of playing to win was it yours or was it tim's or both uh, it, it was it was tim's only because when we used to be called dungeon um yeah, he, yeah. he originally did uh the the original version like he he they covered uh playing to win then yeah. when we changed the name to lord later on down the track and we decided to go back and do a better version of that cover song because we just loved it so much and we ended yeah. up playing it live for a little bit as well which was a lot of fun but um yeah, I think I think John Farnham, in my opinion, and it's very subjective, but I think John Farnham is the greatest vocalist of all time. And I know a lot of people would be like, "Oh, come on, Andy," but I, I think I think he's he is that vocalist that he would have been amazing in a metal band. He is just like oh, such yeah. a great set of pipes. He he's the, the the metal singer that never was, and he had some amazing songs in the early '80s before he sort of went back sort of to Whispering Jack and then his career after that as well. Um, but yeah, that song and Chain Reaction is an amazing album. And I think I think the reason why, I mean, I, I love John Farnham's voice. I reckon he's a talented guy and the songs are iconic, but there's something about um, a lot of, and it's probably similar to a lot of American uh, music that sort of came around in that same era, um, 70s, 80s, sort of, um, sort of iconic rock um, uh, artists that were singing about sort of everyday life. You know, yeah. they were singing about, everyday struggles and, 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 you know, heartache and, and just, you know, everyday life that we all went through and it just made it so easy to relate to and identify with. And Farnsey had some amazing songs that really struck a chord with everyday people. And I yeah. think that's why he did so well on top of just the music being fantastic and great songwriting behind him as well. But um, the, the lyrics in, in a lot of his songs were just absolutely amazing. And, and as you said, Jamie, like, so a lot of that stuff's still true today and, and more so than ever. And, um, yep. and I think when you go back and listen to some of the stuff, you're like, oh, man, how they know. And then you realise, yep. oh, well, it, never, it never quite goes away. It sort of it gets forgotten about a little bit, but it, then it resurfaces again. And, um, and, and, yeah, we're seeing it. We're seeing it on a daily basis around the world, but especially, you know, here at home as well. He's still an icon to Australian music, but I turn a little bit off John Farnham around about the Then and Now album. Romeo's mm. heart, Romeo's yeah. heart. When he went to the jazz type of stuff, especially Romeo Hart, yeah, he had a couple of good songs on that, but it's not like those three classic albums. <laughs> With Whispering Jack, Age of Reason, Chain Reaction, nothing will beat that era, in my opinion. Oh, and agreed. The thing is, you're right. His his rendition or his cover of Long Way to the Top. Yeah. Back Especially in the eighties and the early nineties when he had the mullet door. He can <laughs> he can he can belt that. Now I'm just, I'm just starting to think here. After Bon Scott passed away, I heard a story that Jimmy Barnes auditioned to be the head singer for A T D T before they got Brian. Imagine if John Farnham did it. Well, oh man. That would have been that would have been well, I, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to wrap your head around it because he sings like such a great version of uh, "It's a Long Way to the Top." Um, but 
but you know, I mean, if you're looking at sort of you know that other iconic singer you just mentioned, Jimmy Barnes, I yeah. mean, I think if it was going to be a perfect fit, Jimmy Jimmy would have definitely edged John Farnham out as far as if it was down to the two of those guys. But um, but I've heard, I mean, uh, John Farnham also does a great cover of uh, of Black Dog as well, Led Zeppelin. Yeah, and, yes, he did. Yes, yeah, and, he also- and such a also, gritty voice that he can he can do because he's normally not so gritty with his with his yeah. uh, songs, but it's, it's covers like those, that show it. Especially those old easy boat songs that he's done on in concert as well. Like yeah. she's easy and she looks so fine. He can do basically anything. I mean, Damien, I know I'm ranting on about John Farnham, but <laughs> he was. We had a guy. We had a comedian back in the earlier eighties to. Just a recent couple of years ago, he's retired now. He used to be called the Twelfth Man, and he brought a single out in the early '90s called "Marvelous." John mm. Farnham, John Farnham was doing the backup vocal for that. I remember that song. Yeah, that's going yeah. for a while. Marvelous. <laughs> that one. <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to Jamie you'll have to put a link somewhere in like the description of this episode so people can go and check out that song because um, I forgot that song even existed until you just mentioned it so I'm, I'll be listening to that after we wrap up <laughs> uh, we will man and I mean there's so much things like see this is what I love talking about music it's like a massive digital puzzle we all get connected because music is a way of life it can it can make you happy. It can make you sad. It can make you talk about John Farnham. <laughs> <laughs> There's a quote. <laughs> and, uh, I think what music and, does for all of us is uh, is it, it brings it brings that something out of us that's trapped, and we don't know any other way to to uh, express it or release it or to bring it to fruition in your real life, you know? So music is a way for us to, to escape uh, what, what we're hiding and bring it out and make it real, you know? Yeah. Just one last thing with, on John Farnham before we go on to Lord, because we can't not do this. We can't not do this episode if we aren't talking about Jesus. I mean, Lord. <laughs> but, um, well <laughs> but anyway, um, one last thing, Andy, would you agree? John Farnham could have been a lot more huge or big, more importantly, if he went overseas a lot more. Yeah, definitely. He um, so I know he book... went. He went to England. I know he went to England. Yeah, and he and he, he did re- relatively well in Germany as well. He did a, uh, a few tours in Germany, and um, and I think. I think he had he had a fairly healthy career in in parts of Europe, but um, there's a there's a book and oh, I don't have it on my shelf. I, I need to work out where I've where I've hidden it. I've, I've put it in a box somewhere. But um, it's a it's a bio, biography about him because um, he's never he's never really done a lot of real full length in depth interviews with anybody. And uh, but this one person I can't remember her name. She's a she's a radio personality in Australia, but she did a biography on John Farnham and and got a lot of sort of anecdotal stuff from his inner circles and bits and pieces from him and interviews. But um, there's a story and I won't get it right because it's been a while since I've read it, but um, he was on the verge of going to the U S in the early nineties. And it was around the time of uh, guns and roses doing really, really well um, getting signed to Geffen. And I'm pretty sure there was an opportunity for him to get signed with Geffen Records and do a release, you know, whether it be re-releasing Whispering Jack or whatever it was, I can't remember, uh, and to, to basically spend six, 12 months in the United States and just tour heavily to get his branding out there, get his, get his music out there and really sort of create this foundation. But ultimately, I think by that stage, he, he already had kids. Um, he His wife he's been with for decades and, and he's already – become the biggest singer of all time in, in Australia. And he sort of looked at it and went, I, I don't know if I could do it. And and he made this call to say, I, I just don't, I just, it's, it's too much of a sacrifice to what he already had in, in Australia. And I, I think I've got parts of that story correct, but um, more or less it was, it was John that sort of made the call to say, I don't, I don't, I don't think I can take that next step. I don't think I can commit to that. Cause obviously yeah. the U S is just a beast in itself. As Damien will know, it's, you know, it's, you know, for Australia, we've got we've got most of our cities on the east coast. We've got 
Adelaide down the bottom. We've got Purple on the side on the West Coast and Tassie down the bottom in Hobart. And then we've got a big lot of nothing for the most part in the middle. But the United States, you could spend years touring the entire country up and down, left to right, and still not hit every single city uh, in that country. And, you know, we've got 350 million odd people. You could be there for the rest of your life just trying to trying to make it or at least trying to maintain your career there. And, and I assume that's probably some of the things that sort of went through Farnsey's mind uh, to sort of think, well, maybe maybe this is something that I just don't want to don't want to dive into. But, oh, man, I I agree with you, Jamie. I think I think if he did make that decision and he did jump in, um, mm-hmm. the, the sky would have been the limit for him. I think uh, his songs were exactly what that market would have would have lapped yeah. up. Um, you know, In Excess did really well over there. Midnight All had a, had a stint over there. Uh, you know, and Man at Work was the market for it. Yeah, Man at Work, of course. So Man at Work know, was yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so I think you know the the Australian product of of Australian rock and music. There was such a a lot of electricity and 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 excitement around it that uh you know the american music lovers would have absolutely loved john farnham but uh yeah wasn't wasn't meant to be i don't think they'll and you agree with this damien even though you live in south carolina in america i don't think there'll ever 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 be a a bigger band rock band than acdc once acdc is over i just can't see another band getting to that peak of potential yes Airborne are huge overseas. Airborne, they're huge. But here in Australia, a lot of people saying they're just another carbon copy of ACDC. But Airborne are massive. I love Airborne, and I love I love Lord as well. But the thing is, there's a lot of artists from Australia just that just can't get it overseas. They're just they're not getting that thing. Even the Easy Beats. When they went to England, they weren't really that big until Friday on my mind came. And then after that, they came back home. And, well, yeah, a lot I of think, bands. I, yeah, go on. I think that um, just as far as the U.S. goes, I, I think there's a certain standard for the music that they're trying to listen to here. And... And so, um, and I, I love the music that comes out of Australia. There is some good, good heavy rock that comes out of Australia. And as far as like the, the record labels here signing people on from there, and I mean, I don't understand why they don't, because there's just some really good sound coming from Australia. And, uh, but I think that Americans really, uh, they don't, they don't quite relate to Australia, uh, maybe as much as I do. <laughs> Some of them. I mean, well, that's true. I mean, that's true. We've we've been friends for years now, so I I mean I'm all into Australia and uh, and the bands yeah. there and the bushfires and everything that's going on there is just part of my life. So um, so when uh, when they talk about rock bands here, like. You know, you got Metallica and you got Megadeth and you got uh, Pantera and you've got you've got all these great bands and uh, and then you have these small bands coming from Australia that they think aren't any good but they really they just wail and they they have good messages and for me that's that's where um, that's what truly lies within music for me is the message that's in it so if there's no message in the music if it's just blab then i don't really listen to it but if um but if it has a good message it says something it speaks to my heart and my soul then then i'm gonna love it no matter where it comes from and that's great and i'm gonna turn the microphone over to you dan because as much as I know Andy and Lord, you you just starting to know about Lord. I'll get I'll let you ask Andy about his music band, Lord and Dungeon. Oh, well, and I've been listening to some of the music that you posted. There's just fantastic music. I love Lord. It's a great band. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's uh, it's always a, it's always a, a surreal moment when somebody sort of reaches out or, or says a 
you know, makes a comment or sends a message and, and says, oh, man, like, where have you guys been? Or like, <laughs> you know, I just really enjoyed enjoyed the music. It's just uh, sometimes you feel like you just do it for yourself, you know. It's just, yeah. you know, we, we amuse ourselves. Like, we, we write music or we record music that we just want to hear ourselves. And so and it's a bit sort of, you know, stroke your own, your own ego a bit. But, you know, we just we just love playing music. So when, yeah, when, like, someone like yourself just, you know, turns around and says hey this is this is pretty cool that that uh, yeah. it, it means a hell of a lot now damien i've got a funny story about lord around the time when i was speaking to andy here in adelaide the band designed a t-shirt and it was one of those t-shirts that looked like metallica in justice for all but on it it was like the four faces from lord but drumming for our supper but it was all written the exact same way as the Justice for All tour, right? Well, Andy kind of let out some winds. He said, I wish Large Ulrich would see this and see what he says. And I said, Give, leave it with me. I posted it to him. I don't know if he's responded to it or not, but <laughs> but um, I've got that T-shirt still, Andy. I've still got that T-shirt. But... The reason behind that, there was there was a bit of a joke going on, uh, Damien. There was a little bit of an inside joke because there was a bootleg T-shirt made up from a fan back in the back in the early days, and Large Eric really cracked the wobblies about it. And look, Andy just said, "All right, let's see what we can do." <laughs> and, <laughs> that's basically, what happened. <laughs> we um yeah, yeah that, i mean that 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 tour for us oh um i think we were in between albums and so we we need to go out on the road and i think oh, i can't remember exactly what the timeline was but i think we we're about to go overseas as well i think we we're about to go to japan and no and digital digital yeah, lies digital lies just came out you just went on tour oh no yeah 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 so it must have been too long after because we're, we're still on that that tour cycle um, but we we're getting ready to go to, to, to Asia. So we're playing all through Asia and, and, and Japan. And, um, so we're, we're trying to get, get a bit more money. So we thought, let's, uh, let's, let's call the, the tour singing for our supper. And we used, we used the Injustice for All artwork. Um, uh, well, I think it's the inside, there was an actual t-shirt, um, of, of the, and the four faces of, of the band. And so we put our faces in there, but we also did a photo shoot where we all looked like um, bums, like homeless people sitting <laughs> like down with, with a cardboard sign with the, with the cup for money and whatever, and it says singing for our supper. And so we, we put our faces in there all looking like we were disheveled and, and you know, worse for wear. And, uh, and that, was a, that was a really, really fun tour. That was, uh, you know, just basically it was almost like, hey, we're – we're, we're doing it tough, guys. Come out to a show, pay pay to go and see us play. Come and buy a t-shirt and a CD, um, and we're gonna we're gonna earn a bit, raise a few few extra dollars before we go overseas and, and uh, keep touring. And uh, and it went it went really well. And people like yourself, Jamie, went and bought a t-shirt. And and I've, I see that t-shirt pop up every once in a while. Someone's wearing it on a weekend out somewhere, and I go, oh god, <laughs> yeah, that, that t-shirt still exists. It's amazing. But um, maybe maybe hopefully I don't know. I mean, if Lars saw it. Um, it could be bad, um, but even the bad, <laughs> the, the bad publicity could be good publicity. So as and I said earlier, I'm, I, a, I'm a bit of a glass half full kind of guy. So even, yeah. if, even if he said any, like, any like, publicity is good, good publicity. That's exactly right. So even if we get a letter of demand, uh, cease and desist, um, I'd probably uh, be milking that one for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but but it was just a humour. It was just a humour. Uh, I think I mentioned to you, Andy, I said, why don't you put up a copper chicken that if anyone actually buys a T-shirt, take a photo of it and just post it to freaking large girl. You probably... <laughs> 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 just harass and, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, some, but I do know this for a fact. There was someone that made a bootleg T-shirt. They posted it to large. It wasn't Lord T-shirt. It was someone else. They went to a Metallica t concert with this bootleg they made up and they sent it to Large and Large literally cracked it. He, he went off the deep rail. And, uh, but, hey, that's Large, especially when it comes to anything bootleg. You know, <laughs> we, know what, we know what Large is about. But um, 
just going on this last album that was that came out. It took five years in the making. As it, as I mentioned at the top of the show, you've done some EP, you've done a live C, CD, you've done pre re-recording, box set, and you're looking for a new drummer. Question is, have you maintained that drummer now? Have you got that drummer in play towards a full ongoing process? Well, um, yeah, so I guess a little bit of context with the drummer thing. So around 12 oh years, I've got to try and remember my years now, but around 2012, um, our drummer at the time, uh, Damo, who had been with us for a few years, uh, made the decision that he wanted to move on. And so like anything, like what's happened in the past is pretty normal sort of thing. We'd put the put the adverts out there and start putting a call out to everyone that we knew and say, hey, who wants to join the band? And um, it was it was just really hard. It was always hard to find somebody to commit. Um, we had a lot of people come in and, and fill in for tours. We had um, Simon from Trollhogan. He played for a bit. We had uh, Tom from Tabra. We had um, some other guys come in and play some shows here and there, some, some really good Australian musicians that um, – that uh, joined the ranks here and there for different periods of time. But um, when we started doing this album, we sort of, I think we like Mark, Tim and I, I mean, we've, we're the core of the band and we've been that for, for a long time now. Um, yeah. You know, Mark's the newest guy in the band and he's been in the band for, well, we'd be closer to 12 years now or something like that. So he's been in there for a while and then, then it's me. And then obviously Tim and then it's day dot. But yeah. um, I think we sort of looked at each other and thought, you know what, we're, the three of us are Lord, you know, we're the band and, and, you know, if we find the right drummer who wants to stick around long-term and that's, that's great. Um, and we'll certainly take advantage of that. But um, otherwise we're just going to, we're going to get session guys in, we're going to get people to come in and, and whether it be help us record the album or jump on a tour and do a run of shows with us. And we'll just get the best people that we possibly can and, you know, real seasoned professionals. And so the, the last two are, um, so, well, one thing that we did um, on the past several recordings is um, one of our drummers from years ago, uh, T.Y., he drummed on um, the last few Dungeon albums. He uh, drummed on the first uh, and was a touring drummer with us for the first few Lord releases. Um, he he left the band around well, 2010 or something like that, 2009, and, but he's always stuck around in the background. So he's ended up uh, doing a lot of session drumming for a lot of the releases that we put out over the years. And so he's been a really great asset to us. But um, we got Adrian Griffin, who plays in a band called Low, um, and he did the last tour with us. Um, and he's, he's been sort of drumming on and off for us for the past sort of 18 months or so. And, um, and he's, he is a pro. He is a guy that we gave him everything on Dropbox. You know, technology is amazing these days. And we, we gave him some, some different things to, to keep in mind, some notes and everything. And he went away and, and learnt, the, learnt the songs. And we got together for a couple of rehearsals and just he nailed it. And then we went out and hit the road and started playing shows. So I think for the foreseeable future, we'll always look at the band that way. I think the three of us are, are the band. And then we'll just have a revolving spinal tap style uh, drummer come in <laughs> every yeah. every so often and just keep everyone on their toes. But um, I've, I've always said to the guys, that works now. Yeah. Um, but if someone ever contacted us and said, hey, I, I would really love to stick around and, and play with you guys long term, then um, yeah. you know, we'd, we'd certainly be open to it. And, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what the future brings. But we've been we've been really lucky. We've, we've got a great core of people that sort of surround us as a band and, right. um, and we've been really lucky to put out a lot of great music and, and this latest album, Fallen Idols, that came out last right. year's being the most successful album we've ever released, which is just, it, it was unexpected. It is, and it's the artwork on the on the album and also the production is second to none. And Tim done a lot of great stuff on that as well. Um, in the studio, obviously you playing your bass riff, especially the video clip as well, you know, Welcome Back. Um, and all that, but what I get is, and people ask me about Lord, what makes them so unique, Jamie? It's a hard work and dedication, and they're just so laid back that none of there's no ego in much you guys. And when you look at when you look at certain bands, you can pinpoint where the ego is, but when you look at Lord, there's no ego. There's all guys just laid back having a good time they joke around yeah they can be serious but realistically 
when you guys are up on stage, you know what you're doing. You know your craft. You know what you're playing. But it's like you're having such a great time. And that's what it should be. It's having a great time. And this last album, Fallen Idols, uh, Angels, or so, is it Idols? Angels? Idols, yeah. yeah. Idols. Yeah, it is Fallen Idols. I was right. You can see the craftsmanship of where digital life was five years prior to this to now. Not only it, you guys, not only, I don't, I, I'm not going to say that you guys matured because you guys simply have not matured on stage. You guys <laughs> have not matured on stage. No, but um, that's a joke. But you guys, you guys have, you guys have dwelled, you've got, you guys have dwelled, you are an engine, you're all going on the, on the road to a per for a purpose and a cause. And man, Oh, it's all, all, all pop for you, man. Yeah, thank, thank you. And I mean, I think, I think the sound has evolved over the years, and and in some ways, I mean, I think there's, a, there's an element of maturing to it as far as the sound. I mean, we we learn things, we learn tricks, and you know, Tim has been recording us. I mean, he's got his own studio. I mean, I mean Tim's our secret weapon. I mean, you know, we we've saved so much money over the years by by having our own studio to be able to record at our leisure and, and piece things together and get things the best that they possibly can be. Um, and Tim, as a producer and an engineer, is, um, you know, he, he does a lot of stuff for other bands and has um, helped record a lot of great releases over the years, especially for Australian artists. And yeah. um, he's he's learnt along the way. He's learnt new techniques, new technology, and he's always trying to, trying to stay up to date with everything that's changing in in production and sound and things like that so we're always tweaking the knobs so to speak to try and work out what what's the best that we can possibly do with the tools that we have at the time and um and so there's always been this evolution of the sound so you know i'll, I'll every once in a while I'll go back and have a listen to a couple of older songs from from years gone by and and there's there's you know, I'm very biased when I say it, but they're still good. But when I hear the production difference, I go, "Wow, we've you know we've, we've definitely come a long way." But what you said before, Kate, I mean, I mean James, James, sorry, I don't know where I got Keith from. Um, <laughs> I that's that's your alter ego, by the way, Jamie. It's now Keith. That's okay. That's <laughs> but, okay. Um, that's okay. Well, what what um, I found is we've always taken our music seriously, but not ourselves seriously, and so we always take the piss. And as you as you said before, we've We've always been on stage, just having a laugh and having fun. But you know, we make sure that we put on a proper show to ensure that people, yeah. you know, that people are paying to see us, and we, we put on a great show. and And we do it, we do it through our cover songs. You know, we always, you know, do do some really fun, uh, silly cover songs, and we do some serious ones. But um, and the way that we interact with people, I think it's also a bit of an Australian culture sort of. Um, seeping into what we do as well. I mean, I think Australians stereotypically, um, yep. and it might be a generalisation, but stereotypically we're, we're pretty laid back people for the most part. Um, and we like to have a chat to people. We, we, we love to be sort of on the same level as everybody else. I don't think anybody thinks that they're better than uh, other people for the most part, especially sort of in the, the rock and yeah. metal world. And so we've we've always just we've looked at each other and so we're all music fans we all love watching bands and sometimes we'll be hanging around the bar and we'll have a drink and we're having a chat and then then it, we turn around and go oh it's our turn and we'll get yep. up on stage and, and play and we've always sort of looked at it like that and i think it's been really healthy for us and we see other people that don't take it that way and you know there's a bit of ego and and everything involved um and i mean to each their own i think we're just we're just really happy you know i i try to i always hesitate when i talk about you know fans um right. i can i understand being a fan of music and, and a fan of bands and things like that but in the end i mean everyone's a friend you know everyone's a, a, a mate you know everyone that goes out there and makes the decision to listen to our music over somebody else's or comes to a show or buys a t-shirt i mean they're friends i mean they're the people that are making us do the things that we love and so uh, you know i'll i'll stop everything to to have a chat to somebody and learn who they are and connect and hopefully build a great friendship that you know you can always reconnect with in the future when you come through town or talk on mm. Skype or whatever it might be, you know. It's, it is, and I love that. It's it's just it's just yeah, it's yeah, just Andy, I totally get it. That's and, that's the direction we wanted to take this show. The same thing because Jamie and I are both bogans, so <laughs> we uh, we just sit around and talk and <laughs> have a good time. 
Don't worry, Andy. I've been educating Damien on the words we use here. Bogan. I and, love it. I love and, it. And wanker and all that. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, Damien, you, you, Damien, you might want to um, start purchasing some of Lord's stuff, man. They'll send you some added bonus stuff in it too, man. Oh, so, yeah. I'll definitely uh, – I'll probably order a, one of the albums here this week or something because it's just fantastic music. I oh, appreciate that. And I think, I mean, you know, I, I always say to people that discover our music for the first time, I think the you know, biggest thing, you know, yeah, of course, like any band, you know, you, you buy a T-shirt or a CD or, you know, down, buy, buy a download of music online or whatever it might be, and it all, it all helps. But I think the thing that really is massive is when people make the effort to talk about it and share it around to other people. It's that word of mouth thing. It's, and that's, that's yeah. the old school thing, you know, stuff that we are talking about before. It's, it's word of mouth that is so infectious and spreads so quickly. And so that stuff means the world to us. But, yeah. um, you know, I, as I said before, like we're, we're total DIY, like, you know, I'm the merchandise guy. So, you know, I'm sitting in my little home office here and I'm looking around and I've got, I've got uh, shelves full of Lord CDs and I've got, <laughs> uh, you know, vinyl sitting there and I've got boxes of t-shirts and I've got everything sort of, you know, categorize and everything ready to go and i've got all my packing boxes and you know bubble wrap and all that sort of stuff there ready so when someone flicks an order through then that's me man i'm i'm the one grabbing everything off the shelf and packaging it up and i've got a bit of a reputation now that just because i like to amuse myself more so than anything else but i always throw in some silly extras i've, I've, I've made trading cards for our guitarist he, he hates them because it's me basically taking oh, the piss that is him. so cool um, you know, and, and stickers and I'll chuck in like, and, you know, going back to the basketball, just to come full circle. I right. collected so many basketball cards when I was a kid. I just, especially when they started to not be as popular as what they were, they lost their value. People were get, giving their cards away and I was still obsessed. I loved them. So I was going around to people's houses and they'll give me like these boxes and folders of cards. I'm like, oh, this is amazing. And yeah. I've still got most of them. And so I've got a drawer next to me that's filled with basketball cards and they're all the doubles, all the ones that I had extras of. And so whenever someone orders a CD from me or whatever it might be, I always throw in a basketball card as well, which for some people, they love it. They go, oh, that's so cool. And other people go, what? Like, I don't understand. And it's just, <laughs> it's so funny. And for me, it's just, it amuses myself. I get such yep. a kick out of it. And this is how, just to, to take it to the next extreme. Yeah. So say, uh, so for yourself, Damien, you're in the South Carolina, South, South Carolina um, yep. don't have an NBA team. However, North Carolina is – is North Carolina Charlotte? Yeah, it's the Charlotte yeah. Hornets. Yeah, Charlotte Hornets. So, I, so what I would do is that I go, okay, so he's in South Carolina. Where's the nearest NBA market to you? And so I go, well, potentially it's Charlotte. And so then I'll start going through my cards to try and find a Charlotte Hornets card to include rather than, you know, because the last thing I want to do is <laughs> Chicago Bulls. You know, that is so cool. Or, or a rival team or something like that. I don't want to offend you. So I always, it, and they're little extra things that go a long way. And I always chuck in a handwritten note and say something silly or whatever it is. And it's just so much fun. And it goes back to that whole being on the same level as, as everybody else, you know, whether it be in a bar at a gig or whatever it is, sharing a drink, having a chat. We're all friends. And any excuse that I can get to connect to somebody and make them laugh or go, oh, that's cool, or you know, what the hell? Um, yeah. Well, I that, actually, I actually grew up on the, I grew up on the west coast of the U.S., so I was actually a Lakers fan growing up. Ah, and, right, uh, noted. So, I, so Kobe, the the whole Kobe thing is really near and dear to my heart because I watch, I watch him and Shaq lay them up all the time. Oh, Bam. That's you know, uh, so, and it was every week they were just dumping baskets on people, and it was what they did. <laughs> it's so just you, what they did. I'm gonna look for Lakers cards now. <laughs> get, get him a Magic Johnson card, man. He's a, yeah, um, yeah, for sure. But um, Andy, you collected the cards in basketball. I collected the cards in the NRL back in the '80s in the Winfield yeah, cool. Cup, right? Yeah. I'm a Canterbury Bankdown Bulldog man. I was born in Canterbury, New South Wales, so I'm a. <laughs> but oh, as rough well, as they come, <laughs> I know you, you probably follow the Dragons, which is their idol. But anyway. Oh well, the, oh, I grew up in I grew up in Queensland, so. Oh, you follow the Uncle? Yeah, I mean you follow the Broncos. 
Yeah, well, it was the Broncos, but also I, I lived in North Queensland for quite some time. So when the Cowboys <laughs> first started up, I was still living up there, not for too long. Um, and they were sort of the closest team. So, uh, so it was the Cowboys and Broncos. It was sort of, you know, it was just, it was just that Queensland sort of, yeah. uh, you know, heritage that was sitting there. So, um, so yeah, growing it, up, that was where it was. So when it comes to the state of origin, you follow Queensland, of course, yeah? Well, no, actually. Oh. So, this, so here's... here's just tapping into a little bit of uh, my my personality, um, I was a bit of a rebellious kid. Um, never liked being told what to do. So I always did the complete opposite of what people told me to do. So when everybody started getting all excited when I was living in Queensland to go for, for Queensland and the state of origin, I deliberately, just out of spite, went for New South Wales. And it just became <laughs> a running thing. Every year I would deliberately go for New South Wales. Now, when I moved to New South Wales about 15 years ago, I turned the tables yeah, and I, going, and I started going for Queensland just despite all of my new friends that I started making down in New South Wales, and I just think it'll never change. I've I've got this little streak in me, and every yeah. once in a while, this this little this this twelve year old Andy yeah. pops back up and and just wants to be rebellious, and I'll do something out of spite, and I'll, I'll always regret it, but it does make me laugh. Yeah, I I I can see Andy doing this, Damien. He got this, he got this little chip on his shoulder that. <laughs> I'm against the world. You're not against me. I'm against you. <laughs> take, take no, take no prisoners. I mean, just before oh, we wrap it up, how how long yeah. you got to go? How long how long you got to go, Andy? You you still got you need to go anytime soon or? Oh well, I have to go shortly, but I've still got some time. So yeah, whatever, whatever. I'll, oh, yeah, I'll tell you later. Yeah, you, yep. Just just give me a a rundown before we wrap it up because. The timing, I know you're in the East Coast, I'm in Central. But yeah, going back to sport, and you grown, I lived in Queensland once in my lifetime too. When it comes to sport, do you think Gold Coast, I mean, look how many teams in sport Gold Coast have produced but never succeeded. Do you think Gold Coast should just not get a team anymore because. It's just not bother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, how many teams do they bring out in the in the NRL? We have the South Queensland Kang Crushers, Tweedhead Seagulls, back to Gold Coast Seagulls. Now you've got Gold Coast Titans. they on the move almost. You have the Gold Coast in the soccer. Gold Coast just don't work for sport, in my opinion. What you, what da- Damien's, Damien's certainly getting an education in, uh, in uh, Australian sports right now. But I think, look, I've got a theory about Gold Coast, and I don't know whether you agree with it or anybody else will, but Gold Coast is such a unique place. So Gold Coast, I would compare it, and it might not be exactly right, but I compare it to like a um, like a Miami, you know, somewhere down down in Florida, um, glitz and glamour, um, people with a lot of money, maybe a lot of poor decisions that are being made, very sort of in the moment, knee-jerk reactions to everything that they do in life. And Gold Coast has got that to it. It's got that stigma, which is a very exciting, flashy place, um, a lot going on, and the, 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 the rich and the famous and the beautiful all go there and hang out there. And I think, I think what separates Gold Coast from other parts of the country is that it doesn't, it doesn't have to the extent of other places that real ingrained generational sort of uh, loyalty to anything. You know, to that to that extent, and I think when teams have started, you've had people that have purchased teams or started teams that have got a lot of money, but they're not necessarily sports fans; they're investors, and there've been a lot of investors that have bought or created uh, Gold Coast teams, whether it be in in football or basketball or whatever in the different different types of sports, um, and they've been there to make money. And that's been their first priority. Whereas in other markets, it's been about legacy. It's been about creating something that's that stands the test of time, that generations, you know, your parents like that team and now you're going to pass down that tradition and bring your kids along to the game. And then when they grow up, they're going to pass their kids along. Um, and the Gold Coast has just never had that culturally ever oh. that I could see. And I think that's probably a reason why they've yeah. always struggled. I just think it's just a, it's a unique place. And you could be right, man. Like he could be right. Maybe Gold Coast just shouldn't bother having any sporting teams, and maybe they should just go to go to Brisbane for uh, for any sporting matches. I don't know, but um, that's well, my that's my theory. That's and looking from the outside, 
Um, that's, yeah. that's an observation I've always seen about the Gold Coast. They always been talking about. Really? Yeah, go on, David. No, you go ahead, and I'll finish uh, my my thought on that. Okay. Yeah. Well, what I'm what I'm seeing is, especially when it comes to the NRL or the AFL in around Brisbane and Gold Coast, they're always screaming they need a second Brisbane side. They need a second Brisbane side. Gold Coast. They're trying to make it another capital city. And it's only like an 80k drive south of Brisbane. And that's, that's what I see the problem is. They're trying to create Gold Coast, which is... Gold Coast is similar to like Newcastle and Wollongong. It's like another town, but they're trying to make it into a city. You know, especially when Newcastle still works co- collapse, especially when... BHP went down up at Newcastle. Newcastle just went back to being a local coastal town. But back in the 80s and just before when the Newcastle earthquake, that was considered another city. And that's what that's what Gold Coast is like. They're trying to create that as another city, not not as a township, because there's a lot of, you're right, Andy, there's a lot of rich people there. They've got casinos there. They've got High rollers, profile people living there, but realistically, bad choices make bad decisions. That's all I've got to say. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So yeah, I think uh, I think what uh, what Andy was saying really ties into what you were saying earlier. Um, as far as are they worth the money they're being paid? And I I think it all comes down to do they love the game or not? If it's just about money, if it's all about advertisement and and uh, about a brokerage between these two uh, factions, because because it's about money ultimately. All all the game is is about money. Yeah. Um, but what? But when so, it came when when Gold Coast brought an AFL side in, um, Damien, it's Australian rule football. Um, they the the guy that the number one guy that they recruited was Gary Ablett. He came down, came up from from Geelong in, in Victoria. They gave him a ten year contract of one point. I'm quoting here, around about one point six million a year. Now, in AFL, the top player generally gets about eight to nine hundred thousand a year. We are now seeing some players getting a million. There's only about five or six in the AFL. In the NRL, you've got one marquee player per side. You're only allowed to have one, maybe two marquee players, and the rest of them go down the down the line. Like you get seven hundred thousand here, five hundred thousand there. NRL, their salary cap is a lot lower than the AFL. When it comes to right, the goal. But- when it comes to the Gold Coast, though, Damien, they had no one to really pick. They were picking players from the the NRL to come over to play AFL, and they haven't done it for like twenty odd years. They did it back in prime. Oh, wow. They they didn't play football or AFL since they left primary school. So <laughs> it's like yeah, it's like old man football. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, kind of. Kind of. But what I'm saying is most teams that's been created in the Gold Coast, it's a basket case. It's not it's not looked after properly. They'll have a run for about five, six years, and then they'll get bankrupt. Now, as saying that, there was a classic rugby league team in Sydney called the Newtown Jets. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's the yeah. same, th- same thing happened down there. But the story goes along with this, Damien. When it goes to the NRL, they had what they call the Super League. It's a bit like your American football when you've got the AFL versus the NFL. Oh, you've got your conference. You have your, you have your two conference, and then they play off in a playoffs. Well, that's what they did for one year here in Australia for the Super League. But the thing is, they were... Rupert Murdoch and Kerry Packer were just throwing away money left, right, and center. On top of their salary from the club, 
they were getting added bonuses. Say, say for instance, all right, you're on 750000 a year, but we're going to give you an extra $2 million if you score five tries this year. That's what Rupert Murdoch and Carrie Packer were doing. They were just throwing money left, right, and center. They didn't give a, a damn about the sport because Carrie Packer was going to use rugby league similar to what he did to the cricket with the with the one day series. It just didn't work. And that's when we had and that's when we had Foxtel come out and pay T V and blah blah blah. And well, I think a big thing with a lot of this stuff right. is that it's all it's all short term stuff. It's short term sort of money grabbing decisions that are being made. And and you know, you can tie it back into music as well. I think, you know, the people that are looking to earn a quick dollar really quickly, um, might get lucky but it's not sustainable. It's not a long-term strategy. Eventually it's going to dry up, you know, and, yeah, and if you're, if you're looking to short-term, just that short-term immediate gratification, then you, you're, you're going to burn out a lot quicker. And so, you know, the teams or the, the, the sports, the, the leagues um, around the world that have got legacy and have been around for decades and have built such a, a strong loyalty and, and in music as well, the, you know, these successful bands, even the bands that haven't quite hit Metallica status but have got amazing cult status, you know, going right back to what we said at the beginning, you know, like a band like Corrosion of Conformity, you know, definitely not the biggest band going, but they've they've sustained a cult following that, you know, yep. they can still play around the world and still release music, but they've been consistent and they play the long game and they're probably, yep. in their opinion, probably more successful than anybody else that had a flash in the pan career and played stadiums for two years and then disappeared and burnt out so it's just it's those things where people get really excited about the potential of, of money and and so they make very sort of knee-jerk decisions in the moment and they might hit pay dirt but some but most of the time uh, pay dirt doesn't last a long a long period of time and so that's what's yeah. happened with a lot of a lot of these things a lot of there's like a bit of a common theme like and it keeps popping up in in this chat which is which is pretty cool yeah, that's one last thing on sport, Damien. When it comes to the salary, with a lot of sporting teams here in Australia, it's a, the salary cap is way below what American is. It, it's not. I don't think it technically got to do with population. I think it comes down to the governing body of that sporting organisation, because the more money that you can generate, the more money that you can make. We don't have that here in Australia. The government here, right, and that, yeah, right, and that that is a major part of our life here. If there there is sports going on all year round, whether it's basketball or football or baseball, they make sure that that we are entertained here. It's like Rome. So, I mean, uh, we, yeah, we got sport all year round here too. Like we've got cricket in the summer. We've got netball, basketball, rugby union, all that. We've got all that, right? But yeah. to, com- to compare the salary, what the athlete gets compared to you guys, because you, there's so many governing bodies that is incorporated by the government in America, right? And they can pump so much money into the corporation. And that's a business side of things. Here in Australia... Forget about it, man. They, it, it's like some of these athletes are getting treated like a second-class citizen, but they're not complaining. Some of these, some of these sports stars in Australia, they're not complaining how much they're getting paid. They just want to be able to get on that playing field and give uh, 80 minutes or 90 minutes, whatever the game goes on for, just to do their best. And that's the same thing that goes for music. There's a lot of bands that just don't care how much they're getting paid as long as they get on the bill. If they can get on the bill, if they, if they get on the bill, we'll show you what we like. But there are, and then, then there's another the devil speaks type of thing on the other flip of the coin. There are some bands say, hey, we won't perform if you give us this amount of money up front and then we'll comply. There are some bands, but yeah, it's, it, it's it's see, to, me, yeah. to me, those teams that go on the field and play because they love the game 
those are the ones that should be getting paid the most as far as i'm concerned like that's my that's my vision of it you know i i think that the people who actually go out and make an effort because they love the game should should make more money than the ones that are just going out to make money right yeah for sure definitely gotcha. I, I, and uh, i think in the end i mean they're probably they're probably getting paid the most in non money reasons as well you know just the fulfillment of being able to do something that they completely enjoy and and getting something for it is probably for them you know it's like when people talk about what's your version of success and everybody has a different version some people think success is having the big mansion and the car and the private jet and things like that and other people are like oh, i want i want a family i want to have kids or whatever it might be or somebody might be i just want to do what i love and and earn enough to make a living or or you know for me it'd be like I want to have a beer on a Friday afternoon and just enjoy it in peace. And that could be my version of success. So, you know, it's, right. it's different for everybody. So the richest people out there could be, uh, could be those guys hitting the field who absolutely love it, even though technically exactly. they're getting the most amount of money. If you put your mind and your dedication to it, anything is possible. If you work hard for it, you'll get it. You get the reward in the end. For sure. Right. Now, now Andy, there's been a lot of devastation over the last few months. Um, we're talking about the bushfires here. Your take on it, man. Um, I know Wollongong and the South Coast being devastated and it was like a big max evacuation. My question to you is, though, Dan, Andy, do you think the government waited too long to respond? Because from what Damien and I have been doing, we've been researching for the last five months since the bushfires started up in the top north coast of australia we found out that, yep we found out as reading along and as it progressed to what it has become that there's a lot of there's a lot of political conflict when it comes to these type of conditions now these conditions yeah it it's, it hasn't been seen before but when it comes to climate change and I am going to bring this up. I didn't want to, but the people in the streets have been bringing it on to me, left, right, and centre. They say, no, it's all about climate change. It's not the climate change that you see. It, it is climate change, but it's not the climate change that the government and the media are trying to make it out to be. Right? We just can't fix it up right now. Right? The climate change. But going on from that, um, Andy... How how devastating were those bushfires, and were were you or your friends impacted? Uh, yeah, I, I had a lot of a lot of friends that were evacuated um, along the sort of south coast of New South Wales, the state that I'm in. Um, yep. I've got a house down the coast, um, and the fires got about oh, about five or six kilometres away from from our house, so. so um, I, I live back up in Sydney these days, so I wasn't actually living in the house. We had some people living in, in there, but, um, yeah. uh, yeah, it was a bit, it was a bit concerning. I mean, obviously for, for us, we just want to make sure that, you know, friends and family are safe and, and if things burn down, you can, you can always rebuild. So, you know, the people are the most important thing, but, uh, it was certainly, it's certainly been a very, very scary few months um you know obviously the fires themselves but i think just ultimately just watching how how everybody's reacted to it um there's been so much conflict as you said and and i think that um there's a I, i'm certainly not an expert when it comes to a lot of a lot of these topics so i'm always I'm always yeah, cautious yeah. about how strong of an opinion i throw out there but i mean the the, sort of the perception that i've had from a lot of it is that um i think we as a nation a country collectively and and mostly the government but i think just as a as a as a whole um we were slow you know we we're slow to to really sort of put in preventative measures to mitigate these things that happen every year because we we have bushfires every year that's just a yep. it's the nature of being in this country but this year was nothing like we've ever seen before and they predicted it they've been predicting it for years saying that yep. around this time this the fires would get to a level of 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 great concern and 
Uh, the fire services had been contacting the government asking for meetings to discuss, you know, extra funds and strategies to put in place to help further support to prevent, you know, the what potentially is going to be, you know, the, the worst bushfire seasons we'd, we'd ever had. Um, and from what we can see, they were, they were ignored and ignored for a whole range of different reasons. All, you know, it's all political. Yeah. Um, so it, it was kind of, it was, it was sad in a way because, you know, there were certain things, I think certain things that we could never be avoided. And, but at the same time, I think we could have done a lot more to minimise the, yeah. the, the devastation because, you know, people lost their <clears throat> homes, people have died. Uh, you know, whatever it was, it was like half a billion animals have, have been yep. killed. You yep. know, our native animals, our native, you know, fauna. Um, you know, Kangaroo Island down down your way is like, you know, it's been absolutely ripped apart. You know, and there's there's stuff on that island that will just it'll take hundreds of years to grow back. Just that's been sort of you know segregated to that island only. And yeah. and I think just this apathetic sort of approach from the way that the government has sort of reacted to it has just been, uh, it's just been a bit disappointing. So um, it's been a very interesting time over the past few months just to see how life is now. And, and basically, you know, we're only, you know, we're, we're, we're over halfway through summer now, but you know, we're, yeah. we're, we're not out of this period yet. And we're still oh, no. fires around the country and there'll be yeah. more to come. And so it's like, what do we, what do we do in the future? What do we do moving forward? What do we do right now? Right. And my question is, is what are they doing with the money that they've raised so far? Now, um, we've only, I've only heard one country that done foreign aid. That was Estonia. They put 50 euro into the funding. But no, yeah, other, well. no other country has sent any funds. They send resources to help fight the fight, but there's no foreign aid. But yet, you had all these celebrities and sports stars and so forth raised awareness and they sent and they donated money. But my question is, where's that money going to? I'm hearing that I'm hearing that the victims are only going getting up to six thousand dollars of that money. Six thousand. Yeah, and, well, and most yeah. people and most people are not getting anything because when they gave them the fire map of where they actually live. They're showing an old fire mat that wasn't actually in part of the fire zone. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, yeah. doing, they're doing a debate saying, hey, my house has been destroyed. Oh, but according to this map, it wasn't part of the fire zone. So mm -hmm. is it manipulation? It, 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 it's all about government manipulation. I get that. But they were told about this. They were warned about this. They did nothing. They sat on their backside and just refuse to do anything. Now, we've got the country on fire. Oh, we get the defence personnel involved. If they allowed us to do hazardous burns, and here's another thing I want to bring up. The story that I'm hearing, some of the fires in the fire zones were caused by arsonists being set in fire. Yeah, that could be true. But at the same token... When the government, I'm talking about the state government here and the state councils, the local council, when they stop allowing people to do hazardous burns, it's just going to cause massive build-up of fuel. And unfortunately, where the fuel is, they've already locked the gates so people can't get in. So if, if the, the Royal Fire Services want to get in to do hazardous burning, they can't get in because the, the gates are locked by the state councils. And that's where we see most of these places are started in rural areas where no one can get in. It's a, it's, it's a big mess. There's so many problems that have come out of this situation. Which And you, the only thing you can hope for is that it's, it's been put in the spotlight to the extent now that so many people have seen all of the problems, all of the errors, and that you just hope that there's enough people talking about it that things things will change. It's not going to change overnight. It, it may take years and years and years for, and especially, you know, government's always going to be the government as well. But, yeah. um, you know, I think the, you know, the, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things that need to be fixed. And, and I guess the, the positives of, of a lot of this is that it's like anything. When there's adversity or tragedy, people come together and, and there's been some amazing 
things that people have done to support each other. And, and going back to what you said before about foreign aid and things like that, I mean, I, I, I've got no idea. I don't, I don't know. I don't know of any foreign aid that's been sort of um, dispatched. And then maybe there is. I'm not sure. But um, obviously, um, and you alluded to, you know, uh, the United States and Canada have sent resources over heaps of firefighters, and unfortunately, you know, a couple of American firefighters. Um, I don't know how many. I think there's at least two were, were nice. killed a couple of weeks ago, or a week or so ago. Yeah, which was just horrible, them. especially for them. Yeah, to to come all the way here them. to selflessly right. help us and then and and die is just it's an absolute tragedy and, and you just feel so bad for them because they've they, they didn't need to do that and they they came here and that that yeah. that just means the world but um yeah. you know i mean i i just i look at i look at the individuals i look at you know you said before celebrities musicians um everyday person that's that's thrown money into the pot to try and or, or, or lent a hand, you know, volunteers you know, that have helped to try and assist everybody and try and keep everybody alive, you know. And yep. I looked, I think the big thing at the moment I've seen in the news, and I, and I haven't really read into it, so I don't know the full extent, but there's a lot of uh, controversy around the Red Cross um, because the Red Cross have only donated a portion of the total amount raised for the fire oh, yeah. to the victims. And they're, they're basically saying, well, where's the rest of this money? And they're sort of Humming and ahhing at the moment about where that money's going. So uh, I'm always, I always get worried when people, uh, when charities are uh, raising money because uh, the first question I always ask is where's that money actually going? Yep. And you always have to worry and, and just hope that the money is going to the right place. And and it's good, it's good to donate money. I think people should continue to do that because I think it's really important. But um, I think if you have a chance to um, be closer to the action not, and i'm not saying fight fires or anything but you know it might be donating uh you know non-perishable food items or it might be donating clothes especially if they're people that are closer to home than than others you know it's it's just whatever you can do to add a little bit of impact positive impact and it makes such a difference so it's yeah. um it's brought the best out in people and it's also brought out the worst in people as well and you just you just hope that collectively um, and the world's looking as well. I mean, I'm, I've been watching a lot of the media around the world sort of looking at Australia going, guys, like, what are you doing? Like, what's going yeah. on? Like, it's, it's, it's tragic where we're feeling for you, but what are you doing to yourselves? Like, you're not helping the situation. So uh, you just hope that we, we learn and we, we get better. Yeah, exactly right. Because just before the, just before the bushfires, though, we had another charity – raising money for the farm victim for the droughts, you know? Mm, and yep. we and we had Westfield oh not Westfield, we had Wool Woolworths and Coles in a lot of trouble because of the funds that they were raising wasn't going to the farmers. Mm. We we're seeing the same thing in these bushfires. Now Red Cross have always been dodgy. I remember doing the Red Cross appeal back in high school. And I was raising money. For I them. was going to say something about that, actually. Right. It, it, I, apparently... I don't know why people still. Sorry, I I don't yeah. know why people still donate to the Red Cross because it's been proven time and time and time again that uh, they they pay their top uh, their top employees millions of dollars, and um, and rarely. Do the resources that in that people have donated actually reach the people at all? That's so right. it's just a it's just a big scam, and I don't know why people still donate to the Red Cross because it's it's really just a big scam. Yeah, with okay. the bush, with the bush buyers, there's a list. Do not quote me on this. Do not misquote me on this. There's at least six different charities that's involved with this bush fire appeal. There's the Red Cross, the Salvation Army, and there's a few other, there's three other ones. And that, man, I would not be surprised the money they raise is almost a half a billion dollars. Half a billion. It's got to be close to that. With all these donations coming from the chair, um, from rock stars to celebrities to business people. I mean, one person's donated $70 million out of his own business. That's a lot of money. Right, oh, well, he's a mining, he's a mining organisation, right? But besides the point, I would not be surprised with the money that's been collected. It's 
close to half a billion dollars. It has to be. Right? Because it's all those different organisations. It's not just the Red Cross, the Salvos and that. But, like I said, if only 6000 of that money, up to $6,000 of that money is going to the actual fire victims, where's the other proportion of that money going through? Now, here's a funny thing too, Damien. Some of the houses in New South Wales, and Andy can probably back me up on this, most of the houses in New South Wales, the minimum price could be around about a million dollars. <laughs> Especially if you live in the coast or up in the Blue Mountains. Some of these houses can be a million dollars. Sure. And getting, and getting $6,000 in recovery money, that that won't even pay your rent for <laughs> for <laughs> a pay your rent for long at all. No, I think I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the what the go is with the payments to people. But I I mean I guess you just hope that a lot of people that have houses um, have had them properly insured as well that sort of assist them yeah, with the rebuild. Thing. And then you just hope that whatever whatever additional payment they end up getting uh, from yeah. these charities or via the government or whatever it's going to be is is still enough to help them, you know, help them continue on. But I, I mean, I, I don't know anything about sort of how that's been set up, how it's been separated to, to each individual person. So it'll be interesting to see. I'll yeah. have to, I'll have to do a bit of reading to see what's, what's going on there. But um, you just um, hope that the right people get, get the right amount of money and, and, you know, we can, we can collectively rebuild together and get people back on their feet. Yep. I remember I a lot of, um, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to just say quickly, I remember back in 2012 when Queensland had the floods, that some of the insurance policy up in Queensland was not covering for water damage. Yeah, and, yeah. And, you know, I know for a fact in the rural areas in New South Wales, if you live in the bushland, your house must be insured because of the bushfires. There's so much, there's so much overgrowth around the the place it's not funny and, and and they'll be they'll be paying a premium for that insurance as well so you just hope that people have have made that sacrifice paid that money each year for their insurance and, and hopefully the insurance will kick in and, and support them with what they need but um yeah, yeah uh, time, time will tell but um i think i think the big thing is that obviously like you know Lives have been lost, and I think that's probably the worst thing out of out of the whole thing. And yep. that's that's something that just can't be can't that can't be you know brought back. People can't be brought back. Um, yep. And when it comes to houses and people's homes, I mean that stuff can be re rebuilt. But um, I guess the biggest thing with all this is that you go well, you know we've got to we've got to make good decisions now to ensure that we we don't have a repeat of this again in the future. Like we, we need to, we, we understand this stuff happens. We understand it's going to happen and we need yep. to make sure that we continue to be smart about it and plan ahead and not be reactive. And, you know, going back to what we we're saying before about short-term and long-term decisions, you know, our government, uh, and it's been, and it's very, well, it's probably very similar every, anywhere in the world, you know, government's yep. only in for a term for a particular period of time and they want to make the biggest splash that they possibly can and they're not worried about what the health of the country is going to be in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years time. They do not care. They are there yep. for their own their own party, their own uh, promises that they've made and to make some form of legacy in that period of time and maybe just to make some money as well. You know, so exactly. the, the motivations of the government are, are not representative of, of the everyday person in that country unfortunately so you just hope that the people the population can band together and make enough noise and hopefully collectively make good decisions that ultimately the government can't can't ignore to the extent that they have been um but yep. it, it comes down to people like you know all of us you know just chatting about it and talking about it and hopefully someone someone listens to us you know gas bagging on about it all and goes Oh well, I never thought about it that way, and maybe I need to read up a little bit more, or, or maybe I maybe yeah. I can do something to to help and contribute yeah. as well. On our other channel, yeah, go on, Dan, go on, you go, you go. The uh, the real victims here are the wildlife, all the uh, koalas and the mm. kangaroos and the wombats, and uh, you know, 
all of these animals that don't get the news and can't hear uh, can't hear uh, reports for evacuations. You know, mm, yeah. half a half a billion animals have died, and uh, and there's millions more that are suffering from the fires. You know, when you have wild animals coming out and crawling to human beings trying to get water. Now that's pretty horrible, you know? Yeah, it's, it's horrific. And, and um, it's, I mean, at the moment, what they've been doing the last few weeks is that they've, um, uh, I'm not sure what it'd be in the, in the United States, but we've got the RSPCA, which is like sort of like a wildlife um, agency that you know, takes care of animals and, um, and the well-being of animals, whether it be domesticated or wild animals, and you know they're going out with uh, local locals in the in these areas with basically guns to go and put a lot of these animals out of their misery because they're they're you know there's sheep, there's there's cattle, there's livestock, yeah. there's 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 uh, you know wildlife, you know, kangaroos and wombats, etc., and they're just walking around completely burnt. So, you know, beyond third degree burns, their their quality of life is beyond the point of being able to save them. And they, they just have to go out and put these put these poor animals out of their misery, which would just be absolutely tragic, so traumatizing for people to do. Um, but it's it's the it's the reality of, of you know, the gravity of the situation is just so immense. It's just it's hard for people to wrap their heads around. Um, but I guess luckily for a lot of us, the way that it's been discussed and portrayed and it's become global news is that it, we've been forced to have to be exposed to it and realize how bad it is and and so hopefully it just it, it sparks some 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 better better discussions around it all and hopefully some better decisions yeah right well damien it's been an absolute freaking awesome show you know we just talk like guys down at the bar just having a drink you know <laughs> and well well for you, Damien, you, you're, you're drinking coffee because bar's not open yet. <laughs> oh, no, I have alcohol, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't have some here. I have some. It's just too early. Yeah. But no, this, this, is, this is just so unique. I mean, this is, this is why it's so fresh and so unique. I mean, we can talk about the bushfires. We can talk about John Farnham, of all people. We can talk... <laughs> We can talk about Lord, but this is what we want to bring into the forefront. I know we've spoken over two hours. We might split up, split this episode into two parts, the first hour and the second hour. But more importantly, we are going to drop links into the subscription of Lord Music and Marvelous from the 12th Man. And, <laughs> Thank you. And, and, and the Lord website where you can purchase their stuff. But um, more importantly... You know, having Andy on, who is a champion, he's it, it, just a top bloke. He's a laid-back guy, talks about anything and everything, and this is the way it should be. You know, this is the way it should be. And I I applaud Andy for coming on. I really do. Yeah, thank you, Andy. It was a pleasure. Thanks, guys. And hey, I I love a chat. That's why I do a podcast myself. And any excuse to just, as you said before, it's like being at the bar and just having a drink and and shooting the shit, just talking talking, you know, a bit of a bit of a bit of a bit about everything. And it's just it's a lot of fun. So it's great to great to connect with you, Damien, for the first time. And and Jamie, just great to reconnect and and um, have some great yeah. some great conversations. Now for the listeners. Andy, where can they reach out to you? Where can they find you? Yeah, I've got a really wanky website, so it's nice and easy. So people can go to andydowling.net. Um, I figured I may as well get uh, get the ego ego pumped up and have my own website. Um, <laughs> and then all on there is uh, links to Lord, um, the podcasts that I have. So you can check out um, all the different shows that I've put out over the years and all the episodes. Um, and all of my social media pages. So I'm on, I'm on everything. I'm on YouTube. I'm on uh, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, everything. You know, uh, Instagram. Uh, so there's plenty of plenty of ways to reach out, and I'm always up to to have a chat. So if anyone feels uh, compelled to shoot me a message and and just talk about whatever you want, then I'm 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 all ready to go. And please, please, you have to re-record 
all sons and daughters from John Farnham. You've got to do it. <laughs> I've, got it I've got a little notepad here, and I was just scribbling away, and then as soon as you wrote, said that, I go, I wrote it down. So it's right in front of me. So now the challenge is I'll have to bring that to the table. Guys, yep. I've got a cover request. And um, yeah. I, know, I know they like that song, so I, I think that's half the battle. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Well, if that song ever comes out, we'll, we'll all yeah. know where that's come from. It's come from you. Yeah, I'll uh, just before you, before you, before I let you go, do you believe that, that is one of the heaviest John Farnham songs he ever recorded on his own album? Not not a, not as a cover, but all sons and daughters. Do you believe that is one of his heaviest songs he's ever recorded? I think it. Oh well, it's probably one of the heaviest. It's got, it's got a heavy sound to it, doesn't it? I mean. I think one of the other ones is a little bit aggressive, but it doesn't sound overly heavy. Is um, uh, "Let Me Out" well, off Whispering Jack. Yeah, l- and it's just "Let quite... Me Out." Let Me Out is more a bit more poppy in the yeah, middle. It's a bit more like poppy, got the... but yeah. it's got it's got a bit of punch to it, which is just a little bit of and I and I always imagine some really heavy guitars with that one. I thought that'd be awesome, but yeah. uh, no, that that song's probably one of the heaviest songs that he's done, and then it's a it's a it's got a dark tone to it as well, which um, certainly adds to it. Yeah. He should never have sung with human nature. I will never live <laughs> with that. <laughs> hey, I, just before you go. <laughs> yeah. Just, just before you go. My sister used to love human nature. And me being the oldest brother of the two, I saw human nature eight times in my life. Wow. Um, I'm the only guy down the front road. Here's my sister. Ah, Toby! I go, stuff Toby. But I have to admit, <laughs> all the girls around the time were leaning off me like I was their security guard. I huh. was like, no. Nah. So, yeah, I, I went to human nature for eight times with my sister. No oh, well. Well, I think that's the perfect uh, perfect spot to wrap up this chat. <laughs> yes. Eight, eight times human nature, that's an achievement. So well done to you because that's, uh, that's a big <laughs> sacrifice you made for your sister. Yeah. Good chance to wrap up. Catch us next episode on the Rocket Diaries where we'll speak to the legendary fresh man from Australia from Mortal Sin. Catch us next week episode. Catch us, Damien. Have a great night. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you, Andy. It was it was an extreme pleasure to have you on. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Take care, everyone. And as always, look after your mother, your sister, your father, and more importantly, give us a thumbs up if you can. Catch you next week. Catch you. Thanks.